My name is Max Gagliardi, and you're listening to the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, help me out. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. This episode's guest is Ethan House, the Vice President of Business Development for EnergyNet. Ethan has a passion for working in oil and gas. He's an outspoken advocate for our industry. He also has the itch to start making content. And in fact, he's even recorded some of his own podcasts. And I really hope he puts them out there because I can tell you, I think he's got a knack for it. This episode's filled with discussions about the narrative battles that we're fighting working in the oil and gas industry. We talk about the state of the industry and the challenges that we're currently facing. And lastly, we talk about the ENP deal space and what trends Ethan sees on the M&A front. Hope you enjoy the show. I'm an open book. Um, oh, Mark was so, you know, Mark Edge. I know Mark my Edge. My business partner and uh, used to be my boss back at Chesapeake. Yeah, and, that's uh, nuts. We uh, have been, I kind of dragged him kicking and screaming into doing a, uh, a business partnership with me back about seven years ago. And so uh, he, you know, he, he knows you and I've seen you on emails and stuff, deals that have come across. And then also he was saying at one point, maybe you're thinking about doing a podcast. Have you done any uh, podcasts? It's funny. Yeah. On that level. I, um, <clears throat> so it's, I, <laughs> I'm such a gear nerd. Okay. So look around. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I I love this so much. So I, uh, so back in, um, I guess it was 19, I think OERB set up a, um, they OERB had done a video really kind of powerful thing about the oil and gas industry in Oklahoma and watching that when they were coming out with it, I, um, you know, I saw that it got me fired up, you know, and I was like, something's got to happen, you know, like yeah. there's got to be a voice yeah. out there, you know, right. and of course I think everybody thought that at the same time. So sure. then we'd run into, you know, you in 19, you roll into 20, you roll into COVID and everything else. And so uh, effectively you've got a world of time. Sure. Right. Sure. Just, what are you really doing? I mean, yeah. we're trying to work. I mean, everyone right. was. And so, you know, for energy net, I mean, it wasn't, uh, a barn burner year like it wasn't for anyone else for 19 or for 20 20 20 yeah 20 i mean 19 you understood i mean i think everyone does you know i feel like there's this sentiment that you know especially for those not in our industry um there's a sentiment that um you know the russian saudi pissing match and covid and everything else is what destroyed our industry yeah yeah we were headed that way all through a number of years all the returns right yeah exactly like and so you know, with that, I was like, man, I've got to, you know, like, I kind of like this podcast thing. So of course I start with the equipment side and everything else. And I'm just, I'm such an equipment nerd and, and just a nerd on everything, hunting, fishing, whatever you buy the best. What did, because what if it, you don't, then, yeah. you know, you're going to end up replacing it later. Right. And then right? it just costs so, you more money. Sure. So of course I'm like, well, I got to get all the setup done. So I'm like, I need a Scarlet and I need, you know, and I'm talking to my friend, uh, who's a recording guy and he says, uh, here, and he said, he, I was like, you know, what mic do I need? He's like, oh sure. SM7B, yeah. man, that's the only thing yeah. you can go with. And so they sound so good, right? They do. It's like, they it's do. awesome. Yeah. If you're, if you're in the right spot, that's what's yeah. funny. I had a few yeah. folks that so we did a few of them. They're just like, man, I sound so quiet. I was like, cause you gotta be here. Yeah. You gotta be right in it. Yeah. yeah. You can't anything that's, else. That's I was going to tell you that, but then when you said you had these, I'm like, I'm sure he knows, but that's like the one piece of advice I'll give. Cause people will start talking and they get like, immediately back. you lose, yeah. you know, like yeah. it tones it. Yeah. So you being there, me being here, and then it's going to the, sound really good. The, <laughs> the <laughs> whenever we, it's going to sound like radio quality. Yeah. The, uh, so I gathered up everything I've done a number of them. Uh, yeah. so what I created was, or what I bought at the time. So then I started buying websites at that point. So yeah. I was like, well, I want to name this something. And I'd come up with the energy environment. And so I created energy environment media, LLC. Okay. Um, purchase the energy dot org dot net dot Sure. Which, whichever to keep anyone away from me yeah, effectively. Yeah. And at that time I was going through a number of, um, uh, I was listening to a lot of other podcasts and really listening to podcasts on the other side of our industry. And that sure. would have been stuff like close to home or no place like home. And some of these others where all the climate feels and all the climate, yeah, this yeah. and all these people that were expressing themselves, right. right. Effectively out to the world through a podcast scenario and they were doing so and I'm listening to them and I'm like, Man, they're, they're, it's just wrong. It, yeah. It's just yeah. a, the wrong message that's being sure. sent. And granted, it's their message. And so Absolutely. I'm not going to upset that. But at the same time, as I was listening to those, I was like, somebody has to speak out. But again, I feel like a lot of people had that same thing. And so sure. if you were in 2020, if you were a... Uh, you know, if you were a, if you were a landman or if you were anyone who actually, you know, lost their job throughout right. that entire period, right. I think the first thing you went and did was you created a podcast and or yeah. became a transaction advisor. Mm-hmm. So I ended up with a world of competition on both levels. Um, but it's early, like in the podcast, like if, so if you think about like real estate or I mean, name an industry, there's so many industries where you look at the amount of podcasts, there's a ton of them. It's still super early, I think, in yeah. energy 
and some guy put together a deal on energy podcast and he included like the renewables green people as well. Sure. And I think there was like about a hundred total of that oil and gas were probably 30 or 40. It was sure. more, it was more of the like uh, green side of it. Sure. But, uh, and there's a lot of power and other thing. I mean, there was, you know, there's a good mix there, but really like people have an insatiable appetite for content. They do. People want content. They do. And the scroll is just never ending. You were saying and, that I was watching a, you and JP Warren. Uh, that was a good one. I like that. Cause yeah. it was a good, it was, I think that was a great back and forth outside of right. just energy, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and you had even mentioned during that, I was like, man, I want to talk about other things. And it's yeah. when you realize you're like, you can, you know, I yeah. mean, you can, you can Do whatever you bring want. in whatever you want. I mean, sure. granted we're both in the energy business. So effectively we're talking energy, but whatever it is about you and I that, that, that right. uh, clicks or, or, or what our <laughs> ideas are. Um, I think you're right. And, and you, the scroll is the big deal. It's just, there's so much data out there. Right. Just, where do you stop? I mean, look at LinkedIn and look at, I mean, how far do you want to go? Who do you follow? Who do yeah. you, you know, yeah. and everything else starts coming in. So I think there's so many inputs, a lot of people, you, you just get overloaded. Sure. And where do I go for the information? Is the information real? Is it, that's the other piece, right? So it's, as you've as you've stared at the news and everything else and yeah. watched everything sort of unfold here, I think a lot more people than we realize have a lot of questions sure. of what's actually going on, whether that's within our industry or how we're portrayed, or whether that's with the climate or green or whatever else. There's a lot out there. I don't know if you followed like this Nikola deal with uh, Trevor Milton, the CX CEO of the Nikola's that electric car mm -hmm. brand. They do that. They're advertising the trucks, and he got like indicted this week uh, under a. I think it's the district attorney of New York, but he was a hundred million dollar bail. Like he got wow. indicted for effectively lying and misleading to investors about how effective their product was. Like he had basically, I haven't read the indictment. Uh, I saw some things on Twitter about people that had been reading it, but effectively he's out here advertising this green narrative that we're going to change the transportation industry. They faked the effectiveness of their trucks. Yeah. Like I don't think the truck actually was working and they had a video where they showed it working. And I don't know all the things that he did, but serious enough to, for him to get you know, indicted for this. And people are comparing it to like Elizabeth Holmes and like uh, the Theranos deal. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yep. She had the lied about yep. the medical stuff, but yep. it's just crazy because you have a lot of narratives, a lot of people that want to push certain uh, things, especially in energy. It's like, it's very, yeah, it's agendas and it's very emotional and it's, it shouldn't be, but it is. And it's like, and I've talked about this before on the podcast too, couple things one is the humanizing of oil and gas people and that like and i think even i'm not a big elon musk fan but he sure. did say something on rogan he was like you know these people are providing uh talking about oil and gas they're providing this energy that we use every day and these products that we use every day he's like maybe it's not the best idea to like attack them all the time yeah because they're doing this sure. thing for society and that uh, no one realizes yeah you're back to the plug in the wall it's like well i just plug my stuff in you right know, like no one right. knows the the full track and i don't think a lot of people care uh, right. to be honest right. i mean yeah. as long as they can turn on their lights and heat their home and which is a which is a huge advantage for them because there's a lot of people in the world of course as you know that don't have that i mean right. i follow that you know the, the alex epstein you know uh um you know human flourishing project are right. you are you really um is it about people is it what was it really about to you? right you know right. and so I just finished Unsettled. I don't know if you've read that. I'm um, reading that. Yeah, I'm listening to it on Audible. It's same. good, it's good yeah. so far. Great so far. Yeah. I, I, I finished it, I think, two days ago. and it seemed pretty down the middle. I mean, I thought he did a good job of being like, here's what the evidence shows. Sure. And there's certain things that it does show that there are impacts that humans may have. And, he, and I like how he breaks it down. He's like high, medium, high confidence, medium yeah. confidence, low confidence. Right. And he puts it more of a truly scientific, how they would view it in a study sure. versus how you would see it in a headline. Right. right. And the headline, it is some, you know, catastrophe, catastrophe thing. Right. And then he's like, well, but actually this is medium confidence for this fact. We don't know for sure. There's a lot of variables, very hard to predict. Even within the models for climate, they don't jive with each other. Right. Right. It's like, you've got 10 climate experts and they all are saying a similar narrative, but when you compare their models, none of their models are coming to the same outcomes and none of it, it's just not, it's not clicking in a way that the mainstream media would think you would think that it is. It Correct. seems like it's totally like it's gospel sure. versus when you look into the nuances of the science, there's a lot of question marks and it's a very complicated, very complicated. Topic. As you get there, I, 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 I push anyone to read that book. Um, it's, you know, both like you sides said, it's of the aisle, both sides. Of the aisle. He was, he, he took probably the most nonpartisan approach, I believe. Right. And, and laid everything out to those of us who are not experts in right. that field. I mean, and that was his point. He was like, you know, if you're a non-expert, 
this is difficult for, for other scientists or expert in other fields, very yeah. closely related to right. climate. So right. for them to not even get it, you know, and so I think he did a solid job. I liked his ending. I like you'll, you'll get to it, but it, he, he lays out a pretty decent plan of what his thoughts are regarding climate moving forward and kind of the steps we should take. And I, I think it's probably the most, I, I think I, I posted this morning on uh, LinkedIn or something, one of DRW's deals. I said, I think he was upset at CNN for something. And I wrote, uh, I said, well, you know, bless their heart. They can't help it. You know, yeah, they just right. lack, they lack reason and accountability. And well, and they're, that's their pundits, right? I mean, yeah. CNN is, it's, it's, uh, it's not really news. It's mm-hmm. more opinions, right? And that's fine. Most is, sure. it's, that's fine, but just, you know, take it as an people opinion. don't take it like that, though. People take it as kind of gospel. I've had people uh, reach out. I mean, I've had weird stuff. The podcast has brought out the crazies. I mean, like, it's brought out cool things. Like, I've the networking aspect of it's been really good, yeah. but it's also just, I get random stuff. Like, I posted something. Anytime I have something that's overtly pro fossil fuels, uh, I guess like random LinkedIn DMs from people being like, you're killing the planet, burning the oceans (laughs) and stuff. And then you're like, don't respond, don't respond. And you're like, well, actually it's pretty nuanced topic. And you try to like reason with them and then they respond back something crazy again. Like, you're no, like this guy said, I was worse than the, it was the Slackler family or what? Really? Yeah. He was like, you guys are worse than them. You're killing babies and all this stuff. And I'm like, at that point you're like, this is a religion of this person. And I can't like reason with this person because they're, it just doesn't matter. So you just don't, you just don't respond and engage. But I think the podcast is critical because you can have a nuanced topic. I'm trying not to be just oil and gas. I'm trying to have people across the spectrum on, uh, to have the conversation because I think that people are generally reasonable and we can have nuanced topic discussions. I think it's productive. Most people don't get access to that. So like if you're somebody that's just seeing the mainstream stuff, like you're not getting access to nuanced conversations around Zero. energy. Like yeah. Very little. You have none. Yeah. So, I mean, it take it, to, to uh, yesterday, literally met, met a uh, close friend of mine, colleague, um, in a, in a, in a bigger, you know, sort of wave in Oklahoma. Um, but we were sitting down chatting and he was talking about some other technologies, some other stuff they're looking at. And I was like, yeah. that's impressive. And that's, you know, truly yeah. taking what we're already doing moving in another direction, adding some other things in, coming up with a way that, that is a very green you right, know, version right. of this. And so, yeah. I mean, I can't say anything about it, but it's, you know, I mean, watching that, this is a guy who's died in the wool oil and gas engineer been his entire life. Right, right. Yet he's having, you know, and, and, and an older generation even, and he's yeah. having thought, he's like, no, oh, we could go this route. Let's do this. Right, let's do that. Right. So we're not this, you know, uh, raping and pillaging the planet sort no. of people. I, I'm on the Oakland Wildlife Conservation Foundation. Sure. I mean, I'm a board member. I, right. I love the outdoors. I hunt, I fish, I hike, I bike, I kayak, I paddleboard, I yeah. anything I can do outside. Most right. of the people in our industry are that. Yeah. And so yeah. for people to stare at us and think, well, you just want to just go out and do this. And you're going, no, no, no. You got to understand, like, I want all of those things to continue in the future as well. Right. I have a four-year-old daughter. Yeah. I want her to be able to be a part of all sure. that. You know, so... Yeah. Um, it's the, there, there was an old, I think it was a, uh, meat eater podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with those guys, uh, no. but uh big hunting fishing yeah. kind of deal. But one of the things that, that Steve Rinella had always said was that most people who hunt fish spend a lot of time in the outdoors, first and foremost, are conservationist. Yeah. Um, and we're our own level of environmentalist, right. Effectively, you know, because I'm going to see that thrive and I want to see that species continue. And I want to do everything in my power to keep that around for future generations. I want them all to see it. So we're not this beast that's out here, you know, just drilling holes and, 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 uh, not caring what's taking place. Yeah. I think that it's, so there's a couple things you look at like ESG, there's E S and G. I think there's a lot of focus on the E, but then I think because of this kind of and so I tried to break this down as part of the podcast is like learning. Like I want to sure. learn. I want to talk to different people. I've talked to, I've had, I've had Alex Epstein on. I've talked to people uh, that are in kind of the renewables or ESG space. And I think that where it breaks down for me is sometimes the things that are getting pushed forward aren't actually better for the E or the S or the G. Right. But they're doing it in the name of that. And that's where I kind of try to call it the hypocrisy. Although it is weird because I don't want to be. You know, like, look, some people have their uh, style of being very in your face, like outrage artists, and they're good at it. And there's an audience for that. That's a big audience. And I think that there's actually a place in some way for that because they're maybe reaching people that I don't know. I I, I guess I try to be open minded to all the spectrum. It's weird for me because I see the outrage stuff on the oil and gas side Mm -hmm. and I'm like, wow, they're reaching people. But then I see the outrage stuff on the other side and that like annoys me. And so I'm kind of like, well, 
maybe you could try to hone it more in the middle and target the message. And so focus on the facts and the logic around, sure. you're going to do this because you think it's better for the environment. Well, let's break it down. Like if we cancel drilling on federal lands, like where's that oil going to come from? It's going to come from OPEC. Yep. And these countries don't have rights for women or rights for LGBTQ, sure. or they don't have the governance that the companies here have. Uh, like for example, California is importing a lot of their oil from Iraq, uh, yeah. Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Right. Iraq flares four times the gas that California produces every year. Sure. And by the way, they have no rights for these other social groups that we've really made a focus on the last 10, 20 years in the, in the U.S. of giving these people rights. Uh, and these other countries don't. We're enriching those countries through these policies. Is this really ESG? And it's just this not in my backyard. Or are we selling it down the way? And, I, and that's right. the, I, I was listening to one earlier. I can't remember which. I'm sorry. I can't remember which uh, congresswoman it was. But <clears throat> she was speaking, I think from Georgia, I believe, but she was speaking on it, looking through some of the bills they were trying to pass and was talking about literally no one being there. Right. Them saying, okay, all the eyes, eyes have it. And like, no one said I. Right. And so she's yeah. going, no, no, no. Like, I want to see the call. The, I want to see the vote on this because <laughs> no one said I, like no one voted for this. And so, and some of the things that are hidden in a lot of that stuff, we don't see, obviously we hire people to go do that. Right. We elect them, you know, we elect them to go up there and represent us and, and to see those things and to make sure our voice is heard. Well, yeah. Right now, I don't feel like that's taking place. And I don't think they do either. And so, you know, she was saying like some of the some of the additional things inside some of these bills that were included were not being able to drill um, for rare earth minerals or yeah. something along those lines in the U.S. on federal right. lands. Well, we're just shipping that over somewhere else, right? Yeah. Who are we giving that to? And what are their policies like? Right. And everything we've heard recently on the China side and, you know, what's going on over there and literal slave labor and what's happening on yeah. the solar side and all yeah. those fields. I mean, it's terrible. So right. if you're supporting that, how can you also be here in your back, not in my backyard? Right. You know, as long as I don't have to look at it, I don't care. I've tried to take a very pragmatic view. And what I think when I think about problems, I try to break them down to like a very basic, like what's the basic variable of this problem? Can, can you boil through everything or, you know, get it down to the basic element? And what I found is that ESG or the environmental movement, it really comes down to the climate. And that's the main thing they've honed in on. And that's changed over the last 10 years. And so what does that come down to? That comes down to CO2 or emissions. And that comes down to combustion and combustion is fossil fuels and oil and gas. And mm -hmm. so, that seems to be the number one driving factor. It doesn't really seem like these other things like the S and the G are really driving decisions. Sure. What's driving decisions is combustion uh, because it's the climate narrative. And what I feel like has happened is that 10 years ago, I've been in the industry about 11 years. And when I first got in, it seemed like there was, a, and I've talked about this before, there was a big focus on micro issues. And what I mean by that is like, uh, landowner issues, like mm -hmm. pollution issues at the at the local level local or level. the property level, uh, which is important. I'm somebody in oil and gas. Like if you're polluting somebody's private pro private property, is sovereign in the U.S. Right? right. If you're leased on someone's land and you're polluting that person's land or hurting that person's land, like you need to be held accountable. We can't be good as an industry if we're having spills or things that are happening that are affecting people's private property sure. rights. Like that's just it's step one. You have to do that and you have to do that right. What I felt like was that our industry has gotten a lot better at that. And then there was a lot of narratives that were kind of debunked, like the gas land thing yep. and some of this stuff got nominated, I think for an Oscar <laughs> oh, yeah. turned out that so uh, bad. nominated for an Oscar turned out that it was, there was a lot of just false things All that of were going on. Yeah. He was, it was like, at a Phelan McAleer did a follow up to that. That was uh, what was called frack nation. Yeah. I think that was yeah. a great film that, that right. literally just debunked all of, of yeah. gas land and it right. was here's this natural occurring methane in someone's well there's a woman standing there saying we've had it our entire life right that's why we have this event yeah so it doesn't come into our house right you know it's always been this way you know yeah. it's just george natural. george washington when he was uh in pennsylvania there's a story that they knocked a lantern over and at their campsite and it lit a creek on fire <laughs> and it was the creek uh and this is back in colonial times there's been natural methane leak that's sure. the thing about oil and gas in general this is a naturally occurring 100 percent organic very organic uh it's just you know tree. we didn't create it. we didn't create it it's not like we're manufacturing something sure. that's evil it's like this is just uh carbon that's been trapped and then now it's coming it's life we're, right? we're, we're releasing the carbon and that's the problem like right. i think for that right. other side or the green side I, I truly believe green means dollars give me a break i mean yeah <clears throat> follow dollars and you'll you'll likely follow where everything's headed so if someone you know if the government's willing to offload x number of dollars for some study or something else along those lines that to you and i if we stared at it would go oh it's just a right. wreck right so be it they're still yeah. going to go do it and and we didn't create this thing but again as they're saying well that carbon would have been trapped and now you've released it and this is what's created this problem and right. it's like 
Right. Really? Yeah. Carbon's in everything. I mean, let's well, let's be real. Like it's you can't this zero net whatever. I, it baffles me, but there's no, there's no such thing. Like it's yeah. in everything. You can right. never be net zero. Right. This is the planet Earth. Yeah, exactly. And so, like you think about the localized uh, pollution narrative, which was mm-hmm. easy to combat because you could look back and you could debunk it, and you could also say, "Hey, look, we were really clean." Uh, right around that time too was the BP oil spill. Mm -hmm. So I remember early in my career, it felt like that was very much kind of the attack vector on our industry. And I remember thinking, okay, well, a lot of these things we can do better. Like if you don't spill oil in the ocean and have a blowout, that's pretty easy. You can point to that and be like, we've had 10 years of not doing that. Uh, If you don't contaminate someone's water, that's pretty easy. You can point to that. Uh, But this uh, specter of climate and this global thing, it's not based on anything that's happened it's based on what's going to happen assumptions right it's based on the future and so when something's based on the future it is very deep you can't debunk that there's no way to debunk it because you can just say i don't believe that model or i don't believe this thing and then the narrative is you don't believe in science or you're an anti-climate person or whatever and then it's like uh and we're going to patch all this stuff through and it's just this element of they're they're projecting these things out and that's actually really smart because now they can attack combustion at its core and then that's a blanket thing yep. notice how they haven't really you still see stuff about fracking and it being negative but, but they, not they, nearly they've what left it, it behind because it's not negative like yeah. we've proven it yeah so that's just and so for a decade that was the narrative and then that turned out to be completely false and they've left it alone and then now they've moved on to this which they know there's no way to prove it so it's the cause heads it's uh there's a movie you may be too young for it. it's called pcu um, anyone under uh, 40, I'm 42. So anybody under me likely didn't, didn't yeah. see it, but yeah. Jeremy Piven, uh, uh, yeah. David Spade, old movie, but it was, uh, they had this term for the, it was called PC. It was Port Chester university, but it was literally everything PC that was going on. Right. So everyone was protesting about everything going on every day. Right. And he called them the cause heads. He's like, oh, they'll pick something, stick for it with a week for about yeah. a week. And then yeah. they move on. They'll find right. something else. Right. And that's literally it. Once something gets debunked, once it gets moved on, well, let's we'll find the next thing. You know, what's yeah. the next thing we can go after? What looks right. really, really bad right. that industry? Well, let's go right. attack that. Yeah, uh, on mass, and they do a great job of it. I have to tell them. Mm-hmm. I mean, far better than we are yeah. as far as defending ourselves by any stretch of the right. imagination or being proactive. Yeah, which I think this is what this industry needs is that proactive piece, like you're doing here, like a lot of people are doing. Um, that proactive piece moves things far greater than you think it will if you sit back and you're always on the defensive, you're always on your heels, you're always trying to, 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 I've always said, you know, it takes, um, you know, it takes someone three seconds to make a very emotional comment, right? right? I can say something right. like windmills cause cancer, right? Yeah, right. Done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't have any proof that that takes place. I, I can tell you they kill birds. We do have proof of that, yeah. but you have no proof that it causes cancer. So for you to just say it, you can have a world of people jump onto that bandwagon quickly it takes us in our industry, call it 15 minutes to refute a three second. Yeah. Because it's science. Right. I mean, our industry is built on science, the most advanced stuff you've ever seen. And so, you know, for us to sit there for 15 minutes and describe why this statement is wrong, everyone's already tuned you out. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that like, uh, so this is why I've gravitated away from like, I try, I mean, I will make memes and funny things about digging on people, but yeah. I try to stay away from like the pure outrage side because I think it's easy to be marginalized, mm-hmm. right? If you're the outrage, uh, and some people are really good at it, like they're good at it and they get a lot of the base route up, mm-hmm. right? But what I've tried to take is more of a pragmatic middle approach where I just have the nuanced conversation. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, we want to do these things because we think that they're good. Let's explore how this plays out. Let's explore this policy. Let's explore this comment that's been made. Okay. You think that, and like, look, I'm not going to sit here and I don't know that it's productive for me to be like, uh, just outright being like, Oh, you know, climate, this climate, that I don't believe it. Sometimes I'm like, okay, let's just, let's assume that all these models are correct. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this and say, humans are having an impact. The reality is humans have an impact. Like sure. Everything has an impact. Of course. So then it becomes, what do you do about it? What is that impact? And then what do you do about that mm-hmm. impact? And this is guys like Alex Epstein who do a good job of breaking down. How do you frame the narrative? And you start to talk about what do you do about that impact? And I've been a big proponent of natural gas. Sure. One thing that I try to do, and I've said this a lot on the pod is that if I'm talking my book, I caveat it before I go into the spiel that I'm talking my book, I sell natural gas. Yep. Uh, I'm in the natural gas business. Yep. Uh, that's my big pet peeve is that when people are saying, Hey, save the world, you know, do these things. This is going to save everything. And at the end that I can buy my product. Yeah. Right. It's just, that bothers me. Sure. Right. Like if you're going to say save the world and like, 
you know, guilt somebody about something, but then at the end of it, you pivot to selling something. Sure. It rose me the wrong way. Well, we've so, seen it. Yeah. So I caveat it with, I'm selling natural gas. Like I'm in the natural gas industry, but we look at the goals, like the climate goals and the things and the reducing carbon. I think natural gas is going to play a critical role. Huge. And by the way, we already has. To, yeah. And we need to use all these products. So these mics, all these things, the cores, the rubber, the plastics, all this stuff is made from petrochemicals. Yep. You're going to have to have that. That's not going away. So that's Step one, when someone says, hey, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels completely, I'm like, no, we're not. Like, we have to, we, it's the basis of every input, basically, sure. is fossil fuels. So, and then you look at, like, the actual steps that we're taking, we're, they're dismantling the base load right now. They're getting rid of coal. They're getting rid of nuclear, even though there's a big argument. There, Ridiculous. They shouldn't be, yeah, they well, shouldn't think be about the that. California scenario, right? right? So, you look at, you know, what they've shut down in California in the name of natural gas. Right. They did so. I mean, yeah. this, is, this has already been lived. This is what's funny. Right. If you go back a very short time, um, Vice President Harris was in the Jerry Brown era in yeah, California, yeah. and, and right. they systematically shut down nuclear in the name of natural gas because nuclear was dangerous, right. and natural gas was this great new big thing. Well, why? Well, because they were making money off of natural gas. Yeah, it had nothing yeah. to do with the, the sure. fuel itself, because if you really look at it, you're looking at low carbon emissions and, and no emissions effectively. Nuclear is your choice. I mean, it yeah. produces a lot right. of power for a long, long time. Yeah. You know, and the waste is relatively manageable. I mean, I know that they say that the waste is a uh, big, scary thing, and it is. I mean, no one wants sure. nuclear waste around. But look, instead of launching Jeff Bezos into space, maybe we should just launch this nuclear waste into space, get it out of here. I mean, there's things you could do. I mean, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we should do yeah, with it, but fair. there could be creative things that, uh, and I, you know, and I've talked to some smart people around it, and they say that there are ways to manage it uh, in theory. But but nat gas, if you look at it, it can be an incredible base load. We're going to need it regardless. And uh, you just can't move totally to intermittent energy as your base load for energy. Like, it's look just what not comes possible. from natural gas. We're looking at helium. For Let's start. Let's just do helium alone. I don't even want to talk right. about the rest of it. But right. helium alone, the value, of course, is huge. Um, you know, versus just standard natural gas pricing. I mean, your your dollar per m on that's well it's above like, a, what, yeah, twelve bucks. No, I mean, it, helium, what's current? helium per MCF is like one hundred fifty bucks. All right, so but it's very small traces. So sure, it's, it's a lot. But in in the gas stream, it could make the total stream worth twelve. I don't and know. And you know a lot bucks. about this, but yeah. Right. So I mean, you're in that business. So right. it's um and like helium alone without it, it you, can you imagine telling someone like, no, we can't do your MRI, we can't do this, we can't do that, yeah, etc. Yeah. Like that's what people don't connect. Right. You know when you're, I, I just, I literally take the hydrocarbon scenario. And so you, I think it was uh Schellenberger. I think it was, you know, moving yeah. from a carbohydrate society to a hydrocarbon society effectively. Yeah. And a number of people have done that, right. but I think he did a good job in his book. Uh, but the, um, you know, with that, you know, you really want to get back to a carbohydrate society. You want to get back to truly working yourself and others yeah. in the hot. It's 98 degrees out today with 100% humidity. It's net in zero, dude. It's net zero. Net zero. Yeah, you have you know, it's fine. labor. You know, labor. Your labor. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so people do, it. do you want to be out there? I mean, it's hot as hell today in Oklahoma City. Now, I'm it not saying hot. it's a climate crisis by any stretch. It's yeah. not. It's yeah. just a hot ass day in Oklahoma City with a lot of humidity we're not used right. to. Right. We've had a lot more rain throughout this summer than we've normally yeah. had, right? Yeah. So what's the deal? Everything's green. Green, looks gorgeous. Right. I mean, the golf courses are pretty, everything else. So, you know, whatever those causes may be, but, um, but you know, going back to uh, camping, I mean, literally, like, give me a, like, I'd love to go camping. Don't get me wrong. I hunt, I fish, I do all that stuff. I love to be outdoors. Yeah. I go camp all the time. Right. Because I can go home to my house later and get an air conditioning right. with my wife and kid and enjoy yeah. that. Lucky me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unlucky for a whole lot of other people who camping is literally right. their life. Right. You know, in other countries, and yeah. so, um, or here, even for yeah. that matter. So, you know, solve those problems. Those are those are real things that people that don't have a roof over their head, or when a when a tornado comes through Oklahoma, you know, that tears up a lot of stuff. Look at the minimal right. death that takes place. Yeah. Why? Because we've prepped for all these things. Because right. we're able to create all these things, and and like Epstein says, is guard ourselves from the climate. Right. You know. I mean, the climate's going to do what it's going to do. Let's yeah. guard ourselves from it. If we can build those things in, why not? Right. You know? Well, and climate deaths have been plummeting. I mean, he can, sure. he can show it that oh, they've yeah. been plummeting. It's it's a actually the irony is that it's almost a one to one correlation between hydrocarbon usage and climate deaths. It's or revert uh, negative correlation. Excuse me. So, like the more hydrocarbons we've used over time, the less climate Fewer deaths, deaths there we've are. had. Sure. Right, because people can protect themselves from that's the it. climate. And so that's not an argument uh, in terms of, then they, they want to talk about loss of property and things like that. Well, we've moved, we have people live on the coast. We build vacation homes, you have Literally. all this stuff, right? So people are living around in the ocean. Uh, but the big thing to me, and this is where 
I start to look at, I try to break it down to practical things like what are the goals? Okay, so here's the climate goal. You want to reduce this much carbon. You want to do these things. Okay, well, China right now is over half of the world's emissions or pollution. I can't remember the stat, which I think it's emissions, but it's 51 or something, 52%. In the entire West, it doesn't matter. In the entire Western world could go to zero and we would still be growing our emissions because China is not going to do this. India, these emerging countries aren't going to do this. And so- then it becomes, okay, well, we're actually never going to meet these goals because China's not going to adhere to this. And so you start to think about it and you're like, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, people will get mad and they'll be like, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do better. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to like conserve, make our, you know, make what our impact better. But then it becomes, well, what does that mean? And if it's just to switch to more expensive forms of energy, does that really, number one, it's not going to achieve the goals. We can prove that because these other countries aren't going to do it. Uh, so then it's like, okay, well, things like natural gas, again, talking my book, but we can reduce carbon. If I that's, love if that gas, That's the man. goal, if that's the goal. And we can meet the goals. The U.S. has actually been crushing it. When yep. it if that's the metric you want to use, the U.S. has been crushing it. Well, so, so take U.S. crushing it. Nobody else is. Right. My thought process is, okay, we'll join back up and we'll get involved in this conversation when everybody else catches up with us. Yeah. If you yeah. can drop what we've dropped then we'll chat. Yeah. Outside right. of that, I don't have any really anything to say. You're, you're going to continue burning what you're burning. Why? Because yeah. it's what you're going to do, whether it's your government or it's for your people, hopefully, or whatever else is going on, you're still going to burn those. Right. You know, the coal fired right. plants that are taking place, you look at all these places that have not had electricity, you know, don't get me wrong. I think it's great to bring solar into a small community in solar's Africa. Solar's cool. I mean, like solar, like it's, the idea of solar is cool. It's I, a I cool like idea. The, I just, like the idea of so, like self-sufficient, distributed, decentralized energy. Is, I, it's fascinating to me. Like, I think it's a very cool idea. I'll give you a great, I'll give you a great example. I have, we have game cameras, yeah, right? right? On all of our, you know, all out on our place, right? right. Er, those have solar panels attached to them. Yeah. Those recharge those batteries. Right, right. So I don't have to go replace batteries. Yeah. Great. Fabulous. Those yeah. batteries last a lot longer than me going out every three months and offloading, you know, this chunk of stuff into the trash, literally, and it just runs itself for years, you know, potentially, that's a great application. Right. Does it fit everything? No, no, it's it's not not going to everything. And it's never going to fit everything. A small camera that uses very little power, 100%. Outside of that, no. I mean, like you could do peak shaving with like uh, self battery storage. I had a solar guy on last night, one of my buddies who's in solar now, and he talked about peak shaving with having the batteries here. They're expensive. I mean, mm-hmm. the ones he's looking at, the Fortress home batteries, like 12 grand to yeah. put one of these batteries in. Now, in some places with the really high cents per kilowatt hour, like in the coastal areas, you can pay those things back relatively mm-hmm. fast. Oklahoma's me tough. I mean, yep. it's four cents, four and a half cents, five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we have really cheap energy sure. here. We're very blessed about that. Uh, but so that's kind of a cool idea. Like, you know, you, it gets really hot. I mean, it's wind. I and mean, the problem with wind is it gets really hot and the wind stops blowing. The that's reason it. why it is hot is because the wind's not blowing. The wind's not blowing. So like it's today. like, yeah, right. So it's like with solar, at least here, if it's really hot, you can maybe store some of that energy, uh, put it in a battery, shave some of the peak, and it helps the grid because, yep. you know, but it's expensive. It comes at a cost. We already have really cheap baseload here with natural yep. gas. So does it really make sense economics wise? to debate but um and i'm okay with the emission piece like it you know if you want to drive an electric car etc go for it i dig it you know i mean you know obviously there's some costs there too i mean the batteries are involved right they're not hydrocarbon neutral give me a break the entire car it's rubber rubber meets the road right well it's asphalt rubber tires the entire car is made of some version of metal some version of plastic some version of this i mean it's not like this thing is walking off right. the floor, right. you know, net zero by any stretch. No. I mean, I mean it's, it's going to take Teslas some... have like 700 pounds of plastic per Tesla or something. There you go. Some, someone told me. I don't, know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but, but I mean, just that alone, you're, you're still, I, while I appreciate that, like, for example, I have a one wheel. Do you know what that is? Uh-uh. It's like a one wheeled skateboard. Like uh, it's oh, got yeah, a big yeah. fat tire in yeah, the middle. And you road. stand on it. It's in the middle of it. You yeah. stand on either side. That's Legit. cool. They're fun. Yeah. <laughs> They're so fun. But, um, but that it's a little electric thing that could take me five miles. Right. right? But I have a right. sticker on it that said powered by Oklahoma oil and natural gas. Cause yeah. it is, I plug it in the wall. Right. And where's right. that coming from? Like I, the realization you and I have of what takes place is easy for you and I, because it's like, oh yeah, well, I know where it's coming from. I mean, we're right. a natural gas producer, therefore we're going to produce, you know, those turbines are going to run and we're going to get our energy and everything else. Um, it's everyone else that I, I'm, I, it saddens me <clears throat> the ignorance, I think, and ignorance is bliss yeah, for a lot right. of people. And I wish people did care a little more 
on that side of like where this actually takes place. So I have had this thing lately where I think about information and I wonder why people seem like they're getting dumber and I don't know why I joke. <laughs> I'm like, this just seems like people, and I'm not just talking about energy, I just mean in general. <clears throat> and so I've had this thing where I'm like, we have all the information in our fingertips, so we should be able to be getting smarter. Sure. You know, who would have thought like all the information in the world you could access at your fingertips would make everybody dumber. And then I kind of had this epiphany the other day. It's like, well, is there more misinformation than there is infor right information? So that's great. We all have the information at our fingertips, but if there's five times the misinformation, then there is information. And this gets down a weird rabbit hole about censorship and what the role is of media and all these things. But and I don't want to necessarily go into all that, but I think the problem is, is that the sound bite, that three second sound bite you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. there was like this meme that I saw the other day that had a, a big, I don't know if I can explain this really well without seeing the picture, but it was a big line of people standing in line and there was a sign in the middle of the road and it was a fork. And on, the left side, it said, uh, simple but wrong answers. And everybody was going that direction. And on the right side, it says, complicated but right answers. And it was like two <laughs> or three people, and they were reading a book, and they were walking that way. And everybody was going the simple but wrong answers yeah. way. And it's just like, that's kind of, I was like, wow, that's a really powerful meme. I was like, I don't it know. It is. It's Ignorance just like is bliss. simple but wrong answers are what people gravitate towards, yeah. I think. And that's sad. I, you know, I wish people read more. I wish people wanted to, you know, I wish yeah. people wanted to dig in. You and I do it, I think in yeah. levels, you probably more than me and me than you and on different subjects. Sure. But, you know, I like that learning phase and I like always, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, what's really happening there. Let me, you know, actually use logic, which we were blessed with luckily yeah. as humans. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, not saying that animals don't reason, but, but we, we tend to have a heightened sense of that. Right. right. So right. I, you know, I, it's sad to me that people will just refuse and, and yeah. don't want to. And, and I'm thinking, why not just dig in, like dig in a little, Right. And if you dig in a little, you're probably going to dig in a little more. There's like self-affirmation bias, right? People want to like affirm their own beliefs. Like they're, like they're like, oh, I want to believe that this thing is. And uh, oil and gas people are guilty of it too. I mean, sure. like people gloss over a lot of things and I'm kind of like, well, that's why I've really tried with the podcast. I went into it open-minded being like, hey, look, I want to do, I want to talk to as many people as I can talk to. Mm -hmm. I want to learn as much as I can learn. Um, there's a lot of other factors. I wanted to network and things like that too. Sure. Um, but a lot of it was to learn and to have these, uh, the nuanced discussions. And what I've found is that like most of it's not black and white, even the things that I really believed in. Like, look, one of the things I've come to realize is that technology is really powerful. And just because like I got caught in this trap of saying, well, this is doesn't, it's not cost effective or this doesn't work, but and a lot of technology wasn't cost effective or didn't work sure. early on and it's evolved. So I'm tr I try to be open-minded around things, but where I get cynical is when I see policies and things getting pushed forward that aren't meeting like either the goals or they're not meeting the objectives. And I'm just like, that's not going to do it. Like when you're pushing this thing forward, you're pushing it forward because of uh, rhetoric and because of political things that that's what's pushing this initiative forward. This initiative over here may actually meet those goals is getting shut down. Nuclear is a good example. Uh, some of the fossil fuel stuff, we can actually meet a lot of goals with fossil fuels, but they're not going to do it because it has fossil fuels involved. And people attack like natural gas. They'll be like, well, methane leaks, that's worse greenhouse gas. I'm like, yeah, sure. Well, why don't we focus on stopping methane leaks? Sure. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, yeah, let's just put smart monitoring technology on it. Let's get these leaky pipelines. Let's fix them. Let's make sure that these facilities are, you know, not leaking methane. Right. Like that's a, that's a practical objective. And then it kind of like that, but that's not where they're going to go. It's just shut all natural gas down. And it's like, well, then if you're worried about methane leaking, we can solve that. Like, yeah. Give us subsidies. Give us, uh, like, give us like incentives to do that. And we could do it. Talk in my book again, but still like. Is it a, is it a <clears throat> broad brush stroke? I think that is yeah. what probably, yeah. that's my biggest pet peeve is broad brush right. strokes. I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a, like I said, there was the one I mentioned earlier, Meat Eater. There's a kind of an offshoot podcast of theirs um, that, at one point, they're, they're effectively, they were just sort of kind of working through this deal, and it ended up in a Wyoming. Wyoming, effectively, was the, the state they were talking about. Right. And there was a point at which they, you know, the, the guy says, well, you know, I mean, the problem is not this. And I, I want to say it was something along William Perry Penley, one of those guys, you know, he's Warriors for the West, you know, right. that guy. Right. And um, their problem was him. You know, and they said, well, the real problem is not him. You know, you know, you got to cut off the head of the snake. And they're like, what's the head of the snake? And it was like, well, oil and gas. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he broad brush stroked every, and it true, like it flew all over me. I'm listening to something that I've enjoyed. Yeah. For a period of time. 
the minute he did that, done. Yeah. And, and now I still listen to the other one, but like that specific one, right. I literally cut off. I was like, right. come on. Like, is yeah. this really your thought process? Yeah. You're really saying this? And, and I'm thinking, okay, well, perfect. Wyoming, gorgeous state. Yeah. Lots of elk, lots of this, lots of antelope, right. lots of mule deer, lots of, right. you know, tons of game, tons of hunting, tons of everything else. Well, let's just cover the whole thing in windmills then. Yeah. Where do you think yeah. everything's yeah. going to go? Not well, in their backyard. Gonna, they don't exactly. want to do it there. They don't want to so, have it there. And so point is, is, you know, for these guys who are outdoorsmen, hunters, you know, and everything else, I'm like, well, do you want to see a gas well periodically as you're out roaming around or whatever? Right. Or would you like 750 windmills taking up literally your entire hunting stick? You know, and, and all those animals are going to move. So it, bringing it back to that sort of outdoor side of, of my life, I, you know, when that took place, it really does fly all over me. Like that broad brushstroke thing just kills me. I'm just yeah. like, are you that obtuse right. that you can't see past that, you know, or, or look in another direction or at least be open to some version of like you just talked about, like on the methane leaks. It's like, well, let's go fix methane leaks like, all day long. Yeah, like, we'll right. go do it all day long. Or like, you know, look, let's do power gym with natural gas. If like you want us to sequester the natural, the carbon after that, like give me an incentive to sure. sequester let's the do carbon. It. Like give me a credit to where I can sequester the carbon. We can be net, like that's where people, it's like, let's go, you want to go net zero? Okay, we'll use natural gas and then we'll just inject this, uh, the emissions on this back into the ground. Sure. Um, and just do something here that, uh, if you want one of these after Thanks, that yeah. one's, uh, but like do something local. that, do something that, yeah, these are all, I think these are all, oh, local. They all yeah, I like it. I try to go, I try to That's go local. Fair. There's a gas station here that has all the local beer and it's easy for me to get it. So, it's good. Uh, I got to support local. I like it. But, uh, but like, I don't know that there's like, the other thing that I found too, is that I don't know that there's a willingness to have the constructive debate. And so I don't know if you've messed around with like the clubhouse app or been on these other apps where people can talk like just live one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the oil and gas space on those is relatively, there's, is emerging. There's people that have oil and gas groups. They're small, like, and I say small, I mean like you may have a big group would be like a hundred or 200, 300 people. You get on like the climate rooms, it's like three, four, 5,000 people listening. And then like a big group of people talking. And I know some guys in the oil and gas space will try to get on those and have the you know, talk to him about it and be like, Hey, like, you know, let's have a discussion. And they just get blocked and banned. And I've seen it happen. It's like, they're just, Oh, this guy's, they block them and ban them. And it's like this echo chamber where like, I don't think people want to have that discussion. Like I was listening into one of the climate rooms and the guy starts, this guy gets on, he's, it was, it was YPE and it was the San Francisco chapter of YPE. Yeah. YPE. Like young people in energy. Yeah. That and was I was like, real, I, I thought it maybe meant something else. Yeah. Well, young, okay. pe- young people in energy and it was San Francisco. And I was okay. like, it was the Bay area actually is what okay. it was. And I was like, Oh, interesting. I was like, I'm gonna yeah. listen to this. And so it's obviously a lot of green tech and like all yeah. these, you know, renewable stuff. And there's this guy in there that's a VC and he starts just going off the rails on Texas and how they deserve it because climate change caused this, that storm in February, and that this is what they get. This is what they get for denying climate change. And this guy's just going off and it's like this echo chamber and everybody's agreeing with him. And I'm like, don't raise your hand. You have to like raise your hand to get into the discussion. I'm like, don't raise your hand. Don't oh, raise your so hand. Bad. Raise your hand. Just like, I oh. want to so bad. I'm like, oh shit. And I just like hit it on him, got to. in there and just like started talking. I'm like, you know, I'm like trying to be really reasonable because I don't want to be outraged. And I'm like, yeah. you know, like weather and climate, like two really different aren't the things. same thing kind of, you know, and I said, it's, and I was like, you know, we've had storms like this before. I mean, this isn't like this is something. And I said, to really, to conflate the two and to say that Texas deserved this because of climate change, I was like, that's kind of a little bit messed Shitty. up. And like, nobody nobody supported him. <laughs> Everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it was like, they were reasonable when they allowed me nice, to have, okay. when they allowed me to have the discussion. You. And I, But I didn't come at it with like, you're an idiot, like, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like, I tried to be like, very like, uh, you know, if you thought about the fact that like, these storms have happened in the past. In the past, and yeah. Like, this is not. Like you know, this a, planet's been different than it is today, right? Right. Like that's right. what you always have to explain yeah. to people. Like you, you know, people flip out about what, 400 parts per million on on right. CO2, right? Well, the planet's had what 4,000, I think, is one yeah. of the high points. Yeah. I mean, right. 4,000 parts per million, right? On CO2, like we're not in the worst space we've ever been by any stretch. Where the planet is concerned, and something was alive at that time, right? So actually, let's let's be real. Like yeah. things were living during that period, right? So. They actually were thriving. I mean, the planet back in the because so I grew up uh, fortunate to have my dad was a geologist, so yeah. I was very much. And what I liked about geology, I wasn't interested in like you know oil and gas stuff when I was little. I was interested in like dinosaurs yeah. and fossils and those things because that's the cool yeah. part about it. And so I learned about all the different. He, I remember I had this placemat that I would eat on and it had all the different like uh, epochs or whatever they yep. called them, like the different like time periods where they had uh, the different dinosaurs and it showed what dinosaurs and what plants were in each time period of X amount of 100 million years and then this 100 million years. And, and I just remember thinking that was fascinating. And 
learning that the world was like this big tropical rainforest back then animals grew to be the size of buildings now i'm not saying that's because of we had more co2 but co2 was plant food there was a lot of food these animals ate all that food they grew to be the size of skyscrapers some of them or not skyscrapers but high but rises size, yeah yeah right sizable <laughs> beasts sizable beasts. we don't need around yeah like, right they, they, were, thing. they were huge and it's like well why were they were huge they had an abundance of food and it was very lush and vibrant planet yep. for hundreds of millions of years which people have a hard time even myself wrapping my head around sure and so if you like make that point to people they're just like they tune it out and they're like, that's crazy. That's crazy. You're saying global warming made dinosaurs really big. I'm like, no, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm just saying we've seen in history through the geological record that the planet was much hotter. And during those times, animals thrived. They were very, you know, we had bugs the size of cars. I mean, it was yeah, a crazy. Can you imagine like a praying mantis that <laughs> yeah. would eat us? Like right. that's, this is like a problem. Right. Like, they kill hummingbirds, right? right. Like, like if that thing was the size, like we would be food. And so then it, then it shifts to like, uh, well, it's the pace of warming and it's the acceleration and all that stuff. And like, look, I'm not going to get into that argument. Like yeah. I, I don't, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not an expert around uh, any of that stuff. What I tend to do is say, okay, Let's assume that these models and these things are correct. How do we solve it? And then I am a proponent of the things that I feel like we can solve it with that will help society the most. Uh, these developing countries, why would they, uh, why would they, like, look, if we don't build LNG import terminals in these developing worlds, they're going to burn coal. They're yep. going to burn coal. Like, it's just going to happen. So sure. push forward. Why wouldn't they? They're not going to use windmills and solar for their baseload because no. you can't use it for baseload. And explain to me how all these people are, you want, well, that's that's the deal. So everyone's needing energy, right? right? I mean, for whatever reason, I don't give a damn what it is. Like, again, right. back to, like, I, I think about this. Um, I'll, I'll kind of pull two things together there, which is, um, oh, you saw, um, not the Dawn Wall. What was the other one? Free Solo. Yeah, right. Alex great Honnold, yeah. great, great documentary, just nerve wracking. Like yeah. watching, I was, I've just never, like, I was you, literally sweaty. Have I was you like, ever had? I've never geez. had sweaty palms. No, like I've heard yeah. that term before, and I was watching it with my wife, and I was like, I, my palms are I'm literally like, this guy sweating, is freaking me out. There was sweat on my hands, yeah. and I was like, I've never had that happen to me before. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. it was freaky. No, it's good, but you know, and he he did it. He had a neat program that he was doing where he was taking solar bulbs and putting them in huts in Africa, yeah. effectively. Yeah. You know, so they could right. have light at night or whatever yeah. else great like they have light at night like sure. my thought process is here's these people literally burning wood right in that hut with their yeah. solar light that's now there that's fair like you put that in i appreciate right. that I, i'm not knocking anything he's doing i'm thinking these people need burners right you know yeah. why can't you take natural gas literally under their feet yeah you know in some of these communities sure. that they cannot touch because of government issues and everything else i mean just look at the corruption all over the place and yeah. that explains a lot of it but you know, a burner in every hut, we're now not cutting down trees. We're now not doing all of these things. If they had, a, you know, propane, natural gas, some version of it right. that just ran to that entire village where you got to cook on it every night, you had no question it was going to be there. Imagine the difference. Well, I'm not telling you to change your lifestyle. Yeah. You want to keep yeah. your same lifestyle right. and everything else of what you're doing. I want you to do that. I'm just saying, here's a little help, you yeah. know, like go this right. route, you know, right. so we don't have to go the other. Um, and I think I think that was a Schellenberger's book, which uh, Apocalypse Never, that really touched on a lot of that stuff, which was very eye opening to me because I had not heard those stories. And I think he did a really good job of bringing it to a very personal level because he took a human and said, "Here's this woman who right. lives in this place, and these are the the trials and tribulations she goes through on a daily basis. And if you if you put yourself in that scenario and remove yourself from your current life." Right. You actually realize, like, geez, like this is rough. Yeah. You know, like I'm dealing with wildlife. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. I don't have to deal with those things in my home. Right. So that gets back to again, it's the people. I get back to the people. You yeah. know, we're a part of this environment. I'm sorry, but we are a part of this whole gig. Sorry, right. as much as you hate us, if you do on some level, yeah. we are a part of this, and right. we, you know, we're a part of this ecosystem. We need to thrive as well, not just everything else. We got to figure out that balance. And right. I think that's where it lands. And if you at least are open-minded enough to say, great, I'm glad to look at these things, but damn it, if they're not working, move on. Let's, let's yeah. go find something else. Yeah. There's got to right. be something else. I think it gets back to the broad brush uh, strokes that you talked about where it's like there is going to be an energy mix. There just is. Uh, can we – is there a place for renewables? People will make a good argument for it. I think that there's – I think an energy mix, it's like I look at energy as like I would a stock or, or an investment portfolio – you got to have growth stocks, you know, uh, you, uh, 
blue chip stocks, stocks that are high dividends. You have maybe some bonds in there. You've got a portfolio and an investment portfolio. And the reason why you do that is because you hedge, you hedge mm -hmm. against these different outcomes, right? And so uh, is there a place for renewable solar? I, I'm not a huge, wind is a lot of question marks for me on Same. it. Solar, I think uh, in theory with, if storage could get there, maybe it's not battery, maybe it's some type of physical or kinetic storage. Maybe it's hydro, we pump. Right. And I read this interesting book about, and we talked about it on another episode I just did, but basically it's, uh, they talked about uh, having nuclear as a base load and then pumping uh, at night whenever, you know, every, people weren't using energy, pumping water into these large reservoirs and then letting it out during the day during peak times and to do the peak demand. And oh, like, yeah. That's really interesting. And I know that they do that in some instances, but I'm not saying that there's not a mix needed, but I think it's when you get into this whole broad brush stroke where you say, this is bad, this is good, we're going to convert to all of this. That's when you, the, the, anybody that's listening to this, which most people are probably oil and gas, but anybody that's listening to this, when people talk like that, you should, a warning sign should click on to say, 100%. this is nuanced. And this person's talking like it's not nuanced. Hundred percent. And so that should be that where that red flag comes up, and you say, "I should maybe be careful what I'm listening to this person sure. saying because they're probably not. It's probably not correct because all these things are very difficult topics to just make a one blanket statement." Yeah. No, I think that we. I mean, we saw it. I believe. Um, so <clears throat> at the time, this was a number of years ago. I was in Amarillo. Uh, lived in Amarillo for you know ten plus years, but with EnergyNet, but. Um, watching what was taking place during the shale revolution. So Barnett Shale was the first one, right? And so when you started bumping up against that urban side in Fort yeah, Worth and, yeah. and uh, you started seeing the problems of the urban connection to our industry, our industry has largely been very rural, yeah, right? Outside right. of California, where sure. there's stuff all over the Hollywood Hills no one even knows exists, right? Yeah. So they hide it well, which is awesome. I always got a kick out of this. Like we'd go out to California, like Southern California or, or LA or whatever, and they would cover um, uh, cell phone towers in like fake greenery yeah, like, yeah. to make them look. You know, I was right. like, that looks awful. One, I'm sorry. The fake, I have a big problem with fake greenery. It's a yeah, weird thing sure. with me. But I got some of it in here. There it is. I saw one over there. I was like, this is not growing in here. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, with that, like you're going to that step on a cell phone tower. Like, are you right. that upset by right. seeing steel? Like, if you are, I bet. Get rid of your cell phone then. It's a no problem. going to do that. Right. So, you know, but but what the, what was happening in Texas at the time, so being in the Texas Panhandle, Panhandle Producers Royalty Owners, I was on the board of that at the time. And um, you have to realize in, in the Panhandle being very rural, you know, outside of Amarillo and all these small towns, lots of natural gas oil production. Right. Right. But it's all rural. So no one's really necessarily involved with it. Like here in Oklahoma yeah. City, at least we see like yeah. a pump jack in a parking lot once or in like a while. A flare like a Walmart or a or, curve. Yeah. You know, you go <laughs> eat at like Pearl's Graveside and yeah. you got a flare going on across the street. But you know, we're, I think, effectively used to seeing that. What, what's funny, though, is that Texas as a whole, they wanted to just sort of broad brushstroke again. They're like, well, these rules, we've got to change because of all this urban stuff. What you're changing for Fort Worth and Dallas is a very different thing than Amarillo, Texas right. and West Texas. Right. And so we didn't want any. Uh, it, it was like, here's what we're going to do regarding the urban stuff. And this is going to affect statewide. And you're sitting there going, no, like we don't need that. Yeah. You know, we yeah, don't need that up right. here. If you want to have that down there, that's great. Let's keep that local. Sure. Outside of that, we don't need it up here. You right. know, it's mainly rural. So we don't, we're not going to be under these rules because it would have just killed people. Yeah. It killed companies. Right. Being a part of it. So I think again, that, that broad brushstroke piece, just lack of a better term, just kicks my ass. Well, fighting the narrative and talking about these conversations seems like something you're passionate about. I, love I know it. that yeah. you thought about doing the podcast. Uh, I would. I, well, I have recordings. Don't get me wrong; yeah. they exist. I've just yet to produce. Anything, you need to get. So. You need to get in it. Uh, maybe I can drag <laughs> you into doing more I hope stuff. So, yeah, uh, it'd be fun. But let's talk a little bit about just the deal world. Okay. Uh, I'm not. I know Energy Net. I haven't done a ton with you guys, or and I've seen some of the stuff you sent across. You've sent me some things that had midstream, couple of midstream deals, yeah. yeah, and that's interesting, but. And I know and we don't focus on midstream, by the way, but right. But yeah. producers have uh, infrastructure, sure. so it comes with it sometimes. But just real quick, give the background on Energy Net for people that don't know. Probably a lot of people do know, but just maybe someone that doesn't. I, I always treat it like they don't. Yeah. I, um, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty. We're, we're pretty humble. Like we start. You know, it's funny. I started Energy Net in uh, 2002. Wow, that's a long time. It's 20 years, basically. I'm, yeah, I'm almost been here 20 years in this crazy. industry. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, we. Um, so I started in 2002. Chris Atherton, uh, our CEO, was hired a month before me. Yeah. Um, so we've been together a long time. Uh, we had a pretty core group. Bill Britton, 
uh, started the company in, um, in Amarillo. So we were based out of Amarillo, Texas, which is a weird thing. It's Silicon Valley of Texas. I don't know if people yeah. know that, but yeah. a lot of people don't. But, uh, and, and I went to school at the, uh, uh, you know, Princeton on the Plains, West Texas A&M, and ended up in, in Amarillo. I'd left. I was from Houston. And so, like, I was looking for anything else to do other than be in the panhandle and, right. and got a job with EnergyNet going back up, interviewed, loved it, start up two years old when I started. And it was, um, for us, we're, you know, we're a transaction advisor. We do everything from non-producing minerals up to operated fields, some midstream stuff, of course, on the operated side, whenever that comes to play. Um, and auction, sealed bid, negotiated sales, um, average about 2,000 transactions annually. Um, average probably half a billion to 1.2 a year in sales of, of assets. And they, and they vary greatly all over the U.S. Um, and um, it's been a fun run. I, I've done nothing but a startup my entire life. Yeah. So far. Like in my career, I've, I've literally in my first job out of college. So yeah, right. it's, it's been, crazy. it's been nuts, but, um, but it's, it's been it's fun. rare in, in oil and gas too. I mean, that's not, yeah, a lot normal. of people move around a lot. Yeah. Like, or just maybe I'm not to be more, more, more they yeah. forced to get moved around. Is I mean, it? Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, I, like, I always wonder, talking. like, I feel like I'm the loser. Like I've just been sitting at this one company this entire no, time. You're and, just like the <laughs> lucky one. I was, I've joked around it before. It's like, if you haven't been fired somewhere and, or let go, it's like, you're, that's kind of almost a rite of passage. It's not that I wish that anyone, but no, it's just this industry is like, yeah. Uh, it, moves, know, it moves, it yeah, moves, big swings. Down. Yeah. You right. know, and, and I always tell people when they want to get in, I'm like, look, man, the peaks are awesome, but the valleys are just as deep, yeah. you know? So right. yeah, if you can withstand those, sure. you know, then, then that's, then, then you'll do well. Um, we, you know, so we focused on early days, you know, smaller deals. Our first big client was uh, bank of America yeah. actually. And that was like RTC trust type stuff that was coming out and, and a lot of their trust department stuff. And then uh, Chevron, uh, 2005 is when we pulled Chevron in and started selling non-producing minerals for them and sort of grew with them effectively. And Chevron was our big flagship client because they were, um, at the time, you know, it, it was, I think, 730,000 net mineral acres across the U.S. Wow. that they tasked us with selling. Wow. Uh, we sold them in a uh, five and 10 acre track, depending on where they were, whatever they had. And these were weird. I mean, it, it was great stuff, you know, all over Texas, Oklahoma, the main oil and gas producing states. And then you'd end up with these strange parcels in like Florida and right. Oregon, you That's know, like crazy. five net mineral acres under a gas station in Oregon that they owned somehow. And somebody yeah. bought it five bucks yeah. an acre or whatever it was. I mean, every right. one of them sold. And then we started selling more on the non-op side operations, et cetera. And so, Growing uh, with that has been fun. Um, we've had a good time growing. And I always like that startup phase because those are the fun days. I mean, yeah. you know, nobody's making yeah, any money. It's a big company now. I mean, there's a lot of, how many guys people? Uh, 50-ish. It's a lot of people. Somewhere it's around there, yeah. Company, I mean, yeah. When, we were, when I started, I remember I had a six-foot table in a hallway. Yeah. Uh, at the office. And yeah, I think Mark and I started, we shared a cube for a little while. Yes. Yeah. I like that. You and Mark shared a cube. I like that. It was cheap. How man. was that? Uh, shared a, shared a cube with he's Mark. grumpy. So it yeah. was, uh, you know, but we got used to it, uh, shared a cube and then we shared an office for a while. And then we graduated to our own offices in a crappy building. And then we graduated to our own offices in a better building. So this is all the Encova stuff, right? Yeah. yeah I love so it. And seven, you both being from Chesapeake and yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's been about seven, seven years for me. I left, I was, I w was at Chesapeake and then I went over to AEP for a short stint and then okay. it kind of fell up. It was just a bad deal. But, uh, uh, then, so it was actually been about seven years as of this month. It was July, end of July of 2014 when I left. And then I'm glad doing, you drug him into it. Yeah. He just, uh, I can't imagine how we would have done it different, but he, we were both consulting yeah. and it was like, uh, we had a couple clients and we were just consultants. And then it was like, uh, Hey, this is, it started getting legs. Like we were, we were starting to drum up like new business and it was like, Hey, I got this this group and he's like well i know this group over here and mark's really well connected yeah he is and uh and it was like uh he's like you know you're gonna do a lot of the work and i'm gonna bring i mean it was kind of this like thing where i was like young buck i mean i was 20 i was 20 i'm gonna, I'm gonna drag i'm gonna drag this in and you're gonna handle it yeah i was like 27 <laughs> at the time uh, i'm 34 now and okay. uh and it was like you're gonna do a lot of this work not that mark didn't roll his sleeves up either i mean earlier sure. on he was doing like contract briefs and i remember he was nomming gas and mark was like i hate nomming gas he's like i've spent my whole career trying not to do this and he's like i'm doing this and i was like we gotta nom it like we yeah. didn't have anyone we were helping people market and uh and so it started off very humble and then we uh just started like we hit the wave like there was a yeah. wave of like private equity groups getting funded teams right yeah. and so there was a lot of 
uh, churn in assets and then teams getting funded to buy stuff. And just no one has our expertise really on staff. Right. And then the, so it's like there was a lack of expertise on staff, but then there was also a uh, value creation. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you don't have, you've got some engineer, some finance guy negotiating your stuff. Well, we can save you 10 or 20 or 30 cents. And then you multiply that by the reserves and they're like, oh, that's like tens of millions of dollars. And it's yeah. like, so this charge that you want to charge us to work for us is actually not that big a deal because you just saved us 20 cents. Yeah. So like if you can create value for somebody, uh, that's an easy sell. Sure. Right. Like at the end of the day, like I would say like the business model is just create value. Like that's it. I mean, really at the end of the day, if you can create somebody money, it's easy to charge somebody money if you're making them money. That's right. It's really hard to charge somebody money if you're not like if you're in a, mm. I know like for example, I'll pick on IT or lawyers or whatever, name a service business that doesn't like directly tie to value. You still need them. Sure. You still pay them. But it's like painful. You're like, ah, oh, I got a, this attorney's bill or like this IT yeah. thing. Our IT people now, you know, those rates always go up. But if it's like you can point to like we created your value, yep. uh, it's an easier sell. Yeah, it's an easier business fair. model, you know. Well, it's ours. I mean, it's you know, I sold this for X for so and so, and you have something very similar and or in the same county and right. or literally next door or whatever right. it is. Likely, we're going to see something similar there. So yeah. if you liked that, that's what I, I think. A lot of that comes from you know, people watching, you know, deals go, you know, sell, you know, and they'll, right. they'll come in later and they'll say, you know, oh, well, I saw you sold this. Yeah, you know, you have yeah. a San Juan package out there. How'd that do? And I explain kind of the metrics or whatever, like, right. we'll sell for that. Right. You know, that kind of deal. So there's a lot of that. I think people watch it and, and see it happen and, and see it take place. And so it's that value creation for us has been really the, the marketplace. And so the buyer base and your buyer base is key because you have to remember, um, while the seller has the assets yeah. that need to be sold and or that people would want, right? the buyer's the guy with the money, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, who has yeah. the money in this thing? Who's right. actually paying energy net? Sure. Well, effectively the buyer, like sure. we are selling the asset, the seller, you know, based on how it kind of we're set up, but the buyer is, you know, they're the guys with the money. They're the guys coming in. They're the guys bidding. They're the ones, you know, giving it value, giving it something. At the point at which the the, the process starts, it has zero value effectively right. other than what you and I think it's worth. Right. Or what, right. you know, so if I was selling something for you, you believe it's worth X based on your best recommendation, metrics, et cetera, that you can find. Then I come in and I say, okay, well, we think it's worth about X and you and I agree. And then we move forward, right? Yeah, yeah. It's worth something to you and I because we've discussed what that estimated value is. But until someone puts money in the bank, it's not worth anything. Right. 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 So once that takes place, um, you know, that buy side, we focus on growing. We work like hell to, to, to keep relevant, to keep moving, to keep going on these deals, um, creating more buy side product, more buy side service. You know, what else can we do on the buy side to help them make that decision? And I think if you if if we can keep it in that in that box of <clears throat> we're going to do our best to give you everything you need to make a buying decision right. just through this VDR yeah. and a bid, then I think we're doing our job. Yeah, you know because you've got to feel great about it. Granted, there's the title stuff and everything else that maybe takes place later, but outside of that, you know, I mean the the asset itself is is uh, and then you've got competing assets. Right. So you know again in markets. What's funny is, you know, you see an uptick in oil price or gas price and someone says, well, you know, for this, we could get X. If you have someone else asking a little less, you know, for a little bit better asset, right. that deal's going to sell yours. At, right. I mean, honestly. Yeah. And if you're asking more and if your you know, deal's producing a little less, right. it's, it's competing against that other asset. Yeah, you think, I mean, well, buyers are going to go that way. I got this zone over here that it can produce this, or yeah. we've got this lower decline theoretically than this, or you're like trying to point to something. It's like, yeah, but the cash flow over here or this whatever metric over here is a little better. Just either. looks a little better. And they don't want to, they're not charging as much right. either per acre or per flowing. Exactly. Or whatever. Where am I going to go? I'm going right. to go compete on that one. Yeah. What have you seen like uh, with COVID? I mean, I'll tell you from the midstream side real quick before I ask sure. you on the upstream side, it was brutal. So we have this uh, commitment from a private equity sponsor for midstream and we're out, we were out tasks last year with uh, buying assets. And I think I read something, I don't know if this is true, but I read that it was like 1996 uh, was the last year that it, the amount of midstream that transacted in terms of dollar amount last year, the only, the last year that it was that same level was 1996. So pre shale, it basically was nothing transacted in 2020 and it's and for midstream. And the, the problem with midstream is that everything is, all the money is spent time, like right at the beginning of the investment, like you yep. invest a lot of money in infrastructure and then you have to have this volume growth. Right. And so 
midstream assets that got built in the last five years and then volume growth stalled it's, volume growth started stalling in 2019 for a lot of these plays okay and then in 2020 it fell off a cl- cliff yeah and then it was like if you go to sell it with no volume growth you're not going to get your money back right in a lot of these assets right so sorry there's like a fly so f- buzzing around here it's killing me we're good um i want to i just want to swat you have really a bug bad. assault you know what that is no but i've got a, a fly pump. swatter i'm going to kill this flatter real quick it's a pump uh it's a pump shotgun Oh, you missed. Oh, uh, I'm going to get hit, I think. I just hit the camera. I don't know. If I think you're all right. This is the blooper roll. I like it. I, I'm going to hold this fly swatter here with Let's me. Let's keep I'm it. I'm not even going to cut this Can we out. keep this in? I'm going to 100% keep this Please in. Please do it. All right. Um, um, so, but no, you, need a, you need a bug assault. This is a pump shotgun that shoots uh, yeah, table salt yeah, at I've flies. Seen like that would have been like you would have knocked that dude just out. Just like, <laughs> yeah, done. It even has sights. I'm going to kill this thing here in a minute. We'll leave the fly swatter on it's here. Good. But, uh, but no, I mean, like midstream assets just weren't transacting. And I know that. Upstream, it was uh, a lot of people wanted to buy stuff because yes. they're like, it, it's weird because I feel like whenever the downturns happen, people start to get, oh, like they get excited because they, no, it's they like can blood jump, in the water, man. Right. They can jump yeah. in and buy, but no one wants to sell during the downturn because then they're like, oh, no, I'm, you know, this is what I'm hurting. So, yeah. what's your perspective on last year and then how it's kind of turning into now? Okay. So, um, early, you know, in, like I said before, 19, like for anyone who, who thinks 19 was amazing, I, I, good for them if they had an amazing 19. We yeah. didn't, you know, 18 was a solid year for us. 19 yeah. was not a bad year for us, but it was difficult, you know, yeah. because a lot of things taking place. You had a lot of, well, the, the, the big key there was you had a world of money leaving our industry, right? right. So, we right. were S&P. Well, we were at like 15, 16%. We went to three yeah, effectively right. by that Not point. Good, so, yeah. you know, when, when, the, when, the, when the public money leaves, who's absorbing all those private equity deals? Yeah. The publics are no longer buying They're those not things. buyers. And so it's, it's moved on. So um, everyone was trying to figure out who they were, I think, through that period. We heard of some deals taking place that were in the P- – and this is for anyone on this that understands – PV and everything else, yeah. but um, but we had heard you know some deals transacting at like PV 30, 25, right. 30, right. somewhere between 20 and 30. You know, right. those were where these deals were transacting. We weren't seeing it because our deals were not getting, you know, the ones we had listed, which we still, you know, half a billion or so, I think, total uh, in asset sales in 20. Um, it's pretty good, w- which wasn't bad, but I mean, wasn't a barn burner by any stretch, but. But wasn't bad. I mean, for us to to keep moving through there, and we got some deals done. But those were not in that PV twenty and thirty range. Those were in the, you know, fifteen to twenty range. Right. Maybe just below fifteen. And so, the competition was still there. Yeah. Even even in twenty, because that's because still, people still are like that's when people want to get aggressive because they think that they're going to get this really big deal. And maybe they're maybe it's PV fifteen or less, but it's not. Maybe you're not paying for inventory. Maybe you're not paying that, for... Well, nobody's paying for upside yeah, at that no point. So it's, it, you know, and so you were buying PDP, you're, you know, but but we didn't see that 30, 20, 30 range, like on a consistent basis. And I'd heard those transactions taking place. I was like, well, good for the buyer, you yeah. know, way to go because you're right. going to kill it eventually. Yeah. And, I, and right. everyone saw this moving back. I mean, the negative 34 stuff that took place and everything else. I mean, these are anomalies that take place in this industry, which it was, Jesus, awful. Yeah, that was a bad one. But, you know, it's still an anomaly and it was short lived. Right. right. And you immediately jumped back up in this sort of, what, 30, 40 range ish on oil. And of course, gas has been in the tank for a number of years. So we haven't seen the gas prices that we're seeing now. Wow. In a long time, I far, mean, far before 20. We had 18. There was a spike at the end of 18 and it got strong and then it fell off in 19. It was yeah. brutal. Yeah. 19 was brutal. And it was so, like the end of 18. We had a little bit of strength. But then right. It's been it. And, and then it ended. Then, but what was the strength in 18? What was it at? It was like four bucks in November and December. We had like a really strong winter mm-hmm. and then it was like a dollar something in right. January. It was just like it went it like had two like months. a short, short month. And then like before that, I think the last time, I think it was like, could be getting the dates wrong. I think in 16, we had a spike in January to like six bucks for that month. It was like, whoa, $6. But again, it was one of those anomalies. Yeah. Similar to like this year's February where we had a crazy storm. Uh, we had that strong January and there was a supply squeeze and traders Problem. bid it up. Yeah. Traders bid it up and then it fell off a cliff again. Yeah. So what's, and I, we talked about it this morning on the insights episode that we did, but it's like, can this sustain? Can we have some kind of strength in that gas? I don't know. I'm not, it's hard for me to get optimistic. I don't either. I, you know, I think people are, I think the overall marketplace where we're concerned, everyone feels better. 
Yeah. But everyone still has some trepidation. There's battle r- wounds. Regarding future because you're literally looking back six months and going, God almighty, like I, this yeah. was awful. You know, and yeah. if I look six months ahead, is it going to be awful again? What's going to happen? Right. What's going on with the green right. stuff? What's going on with the government? What's going on with leasing? What's going on? And especially on our side, I mean, we're, we're federal. We're the BLM. I mean, we, we lease all federal leases for the BLM currently right. on right. the oil and gas side. Um, and so, you know, with that, I think... I feel good about the oil price or oil and gas price both, but, but I still feel like the buy side there, there's some caution, you know, it's built in there, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing solid results. I mean, we're seeing people paying, you know, PV 10, you know, PV 50, some more PV 10 to 15 and some better. And and I'm not even going to mention the below the PV 10 side because someone would call me a liar, literally. I mean, it's, but we've had some deals transacted, some amazing metrics. So even PV 10 is pretty aggressive. I mean, realistically, and there's a lot of, uh, for sure. I mean, like, and there's some people, there's groups paying that. I mean, there's groups who really want to get into stuff. So you have to really dial into whether you're doing the competition side or just someone who really wants to buy an asset. And those are, those are, <clears throat> two very different things. You know, the competition piece, you're going to push something out to the marketplace, our marketplace specifically, you know, 35 ish thousand people, which all 35,000 are not interested in your deal. Right. Don't get me wrong. Like there's a subset of those that are, but you know, you, um, you drive that competition on something, you're going to see some better pricing, or you just have someone who says, I want that asset. I've right. always wanted that asset. Yeah, I will, yeah. I will pay up for that asset if they will just sell it to me. They believe in something there that they can do. That's and it. The rock and, and that's a very different thing. So right. if they're willing to pay on that side, that's a, that's a one-off. But if you're looking at a group of call it 12 bidders who are all willing to pay roughly the same price for this thing, then you're talking buyer behavior at that point. Yeah. So now you're looking can at execute what are the yeah. funding at, at elements of it. That's it. It's interesting. Uh, man, it's gotta be though better. It's gotta be better than last year. Oh, hundred percent. Right? No, like it's no 21. No. Yeah. No, I, like yeah. nine day. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like it's, you know, I think this, it's a great time to sell. Um, I yeah. mean, pricing wise, I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. good time to bring it to the market. Don't get me wrong. You may not get exactly what's, you know, everything's trading at commodity wise, uh, in your total, in your final bid, but you're going to get a salty bid and far saltier right. than you were looking at through 19 and 20. Right. Honestly. Do you think that like the consolidation aspect of, you hear a lot of that, uh, we're going to move from a lot of smaller hands to a bunch of bigger hands and guys that are just going to be chunkier. Does that affect you guys or does it really matter? Is it like you just ride through the flows, right? There's a bunch of small companies and they are buying and selling or if they consolidate in one big company, like a take Midcon for example, like a mock, like they're buying everything, mm-hmm. right? They bought up a lot of stuff. I know those guys pretty well. So it's like, do they, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it agnostic around? Because I mean, like at the end of the day, guys consolidate a bunch of stuff, but then eventually like they will probably sell some. They've got to offload it. Yeah. yeah offload like not everything's things. great. I right. mean, I'm sorry. Not every pack. I mean, you know, take every package. There's always going to be something in there. I always tell people, you know, if, if once you, it, whether you bought it through us or not, um, right. I've had groups who've bought deals through us that, you know, immediately turned around and just said, look, Hey, you know, we bought this. Um, we want to, um, immediately offload this part of it. You know, we right. consider that non-core. Right. We actually bought this for X. And so, um, and they'll turn around and just literally sign the assignment, move on. And like, yeah. we relist that one asset and it sells tomorrow. I mean, I had a group that actually profited on that and they bought a deal, they bought, uh, I think it was Hemphill, Roberts County. I think they yeah. only wanted Roberts. They sold Hemphill the next, literally just relisted it the minute we bought it. They're like, we don't want that at all. Yeah. And sold it the next they day. They knew they had to get it to get the deal done. So they were like, that all was right, it. we'll just get it. And then, yeah. Yet, end result, I think, you know, overall, they ended up paying far less for the asset in right. the end because they got, right. a, they got a return on that. So, so every company goes through that. I, you know, that portfolio rationalization piece is probably my biggest. I, that, that's what I focus on. I think a lot with the family offices, especially even the bigger companies, you know, right. you, you've got to look at that tail that you've been collecting for yeah. however long, right? right. Some companies are different than others. You know, some are like, no, we're just a constant seller. Chevron's a constant seller. They're a good example of that. They, yeah. they utilize our system as it should be utilized. Energy net effectively is a great conveyor belt for assets. Yeah. And Chevron yeah. understood that early on and they just kept loading stuff on us. It was like, nope, non-core go, non-core go, non-core go, non-core yeah. go. Yeah. And it was just move it, you know, yeah. Midland Basin. Someone said, why would they sell this? I'm like it's Chevron they're, you right. know, The needle move is different for Chevron than it is you. So take that to a smaller level, even 
and like a family deal or whatever else. And I feel like the, 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 the smaller operators, the smaller family, you know, more family focus groups or even smaller just groups in period tend to hold on to things and you hold things past their effective value range. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's a point at which that assets life that you can still sell and get a nice return on that because there's it, meat left on the bone. Well, then there's like, you get plugging liability and That's just, a, just a bunch of OPEX that builds up and it's like this. But hell, and then now you've got all these plugging guys that are coming out of the woodwork yeah. looking for plugging deals. Yeah. Because yeah. they're going to go turn on 10 wells. Right. They'll plug five. Right. You know, I'm going to buy 15 well package. I'll turn on those 10. I'll plug five. Right. Um, what's interesting about midstream is that it is just such a different, like nothing. So the problem is in midstream is that these public valuations, like the multiples are different. So th there's a ton of like what I would call zombie midstream assets, midstream assets that are just in terminal decline. that are butting up against that point okay. like that. What you just described around how there's a sweet spot to yep. sell. They have far passed that sweet spot. Their runway is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but the cash flow, these big companies, they get these big multiples in the public market. And so they're like, well, why would I sell? So if you go to sell a declining asset and it's like, hey, I can pay you a four times cash flow for this and it's skinny for me. And even with debt, it's skinny for me. And they're like, yeah, but I'm getting 12 or 15 from the public market for that cash flow because the because the public market's right. looking at the whole thing they've got downstream assets they're that are the, yeah they're a hundred year asset over here you got if you're williams you got transco that pipeline is going to deliver gas forever basically in the u.s so it's an asset that lives forever there's a huge multiple in the public market for that they got other assets that are just declining and they're butting up against where the fixed costs are going to overtake the uh the revenue or the ebitda and you're like offload that to me and they're like give me a 12 times or a 10 times and you're like that's a negative 50 percent irr if i yeah. paid you that and they're like well then i'm never going to sell it and so the midstream space is just very different because uh guys just there's this scalability involved with pipelines where in theory if you have a pipeline or a plant or a midstream asset and it's got solid acres behind it in theory, you don't have to spend a lot of capital to up the earnings for that, right? Okay. For an EMP, you got to drill a well. Right. You, you got to spend capital. The capital is directly tied to yep. the earnings. And with midstream, in theory, someone could come in and start drilling a bunch of wells, and it might be just incremental capital. Like I got to spend a couple hundred grand to go connect that well, and I'm going to make a you know million plus dollars on the gas flow yep. from that. And so that's why they traded a higher multiple, but. It's caused the M&A market to be very challenged because no big guys want to ever sell anything because they get rewarded heavily for just having cash flow and distributing it to investors. The small guys don't want to sell anything because they're going to lose their asses basically because they spent a bunch of money and the only way they get their equity back is on some kind of hockey stick growth, yep. right? And so they're like, we're not selling this. And so I just, it's a challenging M and A market. There's not a lot like of what has been? Yeah, so I was going to ask you. Like even current. Like what's happening current? Nothing. No one's buying zero. It. Very very little. Okay. I mean, there's just there's been some consolidations like in Midcon. Yeah. Uh, so Talog, the friends of ours, yep. Carlos and Lindell used to work for yeah. Mark. Carlos used to be my boss. Buddies of ours, uh, they are now hooked up with Tailwater. They were with yep. Flat I heard Rock. that the other day actually. And they uh, mm. they were hooked up with Tailwater now, and they've just kind of rolled in a lot of these midstream assets into the Talog brand, but none of it's been cash deals. It's all been non-cash. Okay. It's all been on paper. Like you give me this equity in return, you get it's this like ownership. Yeah, yeah. It's just cause they don't want to mark anything to market. Yep. And if it's just a non-cash, they don't have to market. So, yep. and then it's kind of this like hunker down, consolidate cut costs to live for another day. But there's not been a lot of true sales, like someone buying something for cash. It's just like a lot of uh, paper stuff. And then you look at like a lot of the assets around Midcon. So we'll pick on Oklahoma cause this is our backyard. But you've got midstream assets all over the place that yep. are just anemic. Like they're declining, term, terminally declining. They've not added or any. Or shut in already. Or, or shut in, right. And so you're like, okay, well, that guy should be a seller. They're not even thinking about selling. Like ETC, they just, they're merging with Enable. It's not a good thing for Oklahoma City, by the way, that deal. It's bad. ETC is the big bad wolf. They're kind of like the mafia with midstream. Okay. They, buy, they, buy, they bought that. They did that merger for the downstream for the residue market yep. stuff, but they're going to get all the midstream with it. They did the sim gas deal where they got the sim gas assets, which is in the mist line. There's a bunch of plants up there and it used to be a Chesapeake asset with the plant, but they just, they do all these big mergers and consolidations and they never sell anything. And you're like, you guys, here's the system over here. Like a good example was Talok had their first big flip. And on top of that acreage was a, used to be PVR, then it got bought by Regency, then Regency got bought by ETC. ETC owned all this pipeline right on top of that Talok system. 
they weren't really even competing for that business. It was just kind of like, we don't really care about midstream. We care about downstream assets. This is just sitting here. We'll tell it, got after it and got a bunch of it dedicated, sold it for a billion and a half dollars, created yeah. generational wealth. ETC shrugged it off, whatever. It's just not their model. And yeah. they're like, well, hey, then sell it to me. Then I'll optimize the system. And they're sure. like, nah, no, we're not selling it. It's just weird. We'll it's hold a, it. It's, they just hold it and sit there and they just cash flow it forever. Eating. It's a weird, it's a well, different I mean, I can't space. say that. Nah, I can't say that like that didn't happen in the MP space. I mean, I, I watch, I watch, uh, I, I mean, I have a lot of conversations on a daily as you do. I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, someone calls, hey, we're thinking about, right? That's always the right, start. I always right. like that one. Like, hey, we're thinking about selling. I was like, yeah, I get it. Like, it's, you know, who didn't, who didn't, right. you know, at whatever right. time, you know, I think everyone always thinks about selling at some yeah, point yeah. of some yeah. version of something that you've got. I mean, if something's worth, listen, if the dollar value works, it's for sale. Right. Effectively. Everything right. is for sale, except in your world. The, the yeah, uh, that's weird. But you watch, know. you know, a lot it of it would work if you offered a high enough multiple that you couldn't make money. That's on, fair. I mean. I mean, that's, but that's a lot of it on the, on the EMP side, probably on the smaller, a lot of times on the smaller, there's some bigger guys that are pretty tight with stuff. You know, they just, they're not sellers. They don't like to sell. It's a, whether it's a liability issue, whether it's a <clears throat> name issue, whether and literally ego yeah, uh, right. alone just right. says, you know, Hey, we're not going to sell this because you know, like I don't want somebody coming in there and screwing this up for all these people that I've, you know, worked with all these years, you know, right. I mean, here's right. my non-op partners that I don't want anything to happen to. So on those levels, we still see that. I mean, I still see it. Like someone comes to me and they'll say, Hey, we, you know, we, we've decided to go ahead and sell this and I'm staring at it. And I'm like, you have nothing to sell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they're like, no, yeah. no, no. Like here's, you know, production or, you know, we want X and I'm like, you're not going to get that. And it's not right. going to sell because you're asking way too much. Right. There's not enough left there. It's, you know, it's, it's last leg. I mean, I'm, uh, you miss the boat. Yeah. I'm, you missed that. You window. know, there's, there's, there's a space that you should offer. Point of diminishing stuff. returns. That's it. it. And there's off, a tail yeah. of assets in every company. And if you'll just constantly flow those and if you'll constantly look at those and prune them, constant pruning is the kicker. Right. That's right. where, you know, you get rid of stuff that you're, you know, you're spending money on that's not bringing back what it should, right? right? right. So let's offload that to a guy that's a little smaller than you. Yeah, yeah. He's going to cut a few more corners. And that's the market. I mean, it's a, it's a feed system. You know, for a while there, it was a private equity side. It was like, oh, we'll just go gather up a bunch of acres, drill a couple of wells, and we'll sell it up to a Devon or a this or a that, you know, and yeah. a bigger guy, yeah. and they'll buy it. And, you know, Felix and right all those guys, which, you know, call me two of those, but where's the other thousand that did that? Right. They're right. not. They, they, they crashed. So right. on that level, it's um, – on that level, I think we're, um, you know, that – those groups are going to, you know, continue, hold assets, keep them too long. They just can't help it. They right. don't want to get rid of stuff. And I get that. And then that's fair. But at the same time, don't expect, you know, fireworks whenever we take it out to the market. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. We got out and took a break for a couple of minutes during this segment. And then when we came back in, uh, we completely changed topics. So just wanted to fill you in that that happened. But what, before you go into this, I will tell you that the next segment that I wanted to do, so for anybody that will cut this, but we just went and That's took a fine. break for a second and we're going to get this last segment. I want to talk about content. Okay. I know that you're clearly into it. You enjoy, I can tell that you enjoy this and I've enjoyed it with you because oh, I, yeah. I can tell that you're, uh, that you like it. And I like, uh, I like doing content. It's fun. So then go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I want to preference it by that because I know they do. Uh, ask. <laughs> no, um, it's, you know, when I first, you know, thought of, of this whole deal, it was like, I was just like, no, we're just going to like, we're just going to record. Yeah. And then I'm just going to produce it and it's going to be done. You know, like yeah. you don't get an edit. So, yeah, right. so of course, on like that idea of like, you know, you're going to sign off your life here. Like, you, you know, yeah. sign this contract. Yeah. I own your stuff, which you do at this point. Like this is your podcast. You own my, right. Right. my recording you own. So yeah. you can do whatever you want to with it. And so. Um, you know, when doing that, it was, I was like, I was always like, I'm just, we're just going to do live version, like effectively live versions. Yeah, Granted, right. this is recorded, but I don't want to do a lot of post, you right, know, I don't want right. to deal with a lot of posts. It's, it's tough. So, it's it's tough. tough. And so have you heard of Descript and all that? Yeah. What's Descript? Have you seen Descript? Uh -uh, I don't think oh, so. God. Great program. It would have recorded this along with us verbatim. Yeah. Um, amazing recognition software. Does it do the, does the text to text voice to, to voice? Text? Yeah. 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 It'll do the voice to text. It'll do all that kind of stuff. And so then once you get your voice loaded in too, you literally go in and just change the text in the deal and it's changing your entire recording and everything else at the same time. Awesome. Everything's done at the same time. And you check um, that out. It's a, it's a, it's a solid program to script. Um, 
and John Lahr, he's our one of our head IT guys who I've worked with for 20 years. And he's, yeah. he's like, you need to check this out on your podcast stuff that you're looking at doing and all this. And I was like, yeah, I need to. And so started messing with it. And it's pretty, pretty lights out. I mean, it's, it's amazing what it can pick up and, and, and truly grab. Like not the voice recognition stuff we're used to from the old days where it was, you know, like sort of pick up this, sort of pick yeah. up that. But it would, it, it literally word for word. And then you change it out. And it's like, and all of a sudden you're saying, oh, not that, but this, right. you know, it's right. pretty great. But uh, anyway, awesome. we, can, we can move ahead. Yeah, well, I just was going to see, like, you know, uh, it seems like you enjoy doing this. You've talked about how you did some recordings. Like, if you were to do content or if you were to move forward doing it, like, what do you want to do? What did you want to do and what do you want to do? Uh, and what draws you to it and what do you like about it? Uh, the energy environment, when I created that, um, my idea was bring, the same as you bringing everyone in, you know, it doesn't, you know, I want to bring in a wind guy. I want to bring in, a, right. I want to bring in everybody. Like, let's chat about this right. and, and have a real conversation and not, not the fluff and bullshit that you see, you know, out in the general media. Right. right. Like I want to really dig down, you know, because on the wind side, like I always have questions and, and I know these have been answered a number of times, but it's, you know, what's your, you know, <clears throat> a wind turbine by itself starts with a lot of concrete. Right. Right. And so just the concrete and steel alone that goes into the base, we haven't even started erecting the turbine. Okay. We're not even talking the pieces and parts that were manufactured across the pond shipped over here. What did that cost? What was the manufacturing cost? What is it built from? What are, what are the inner workings? What are the hydraulics? What are the nacelles? What are the, you know, what are all these things made of the, the blades, everything else. Right. And so you, you're not even taking that piece into it. You're literally just taking the concrete and steel and the hydrocarbons used yeah. to create that base. Okay it's going to take that wind turbine. So an average life of wind turbine is, this is where this all started for me. The average life was about 20 years, I think at the time. And I think it's still about that, I think of a, yeah. a farm effectively before right. it's sort of decommissioned and no longer valid. Um, I don't, uh, again, somebody correct me, please. Someone correct me on all that. Yeah, but, yeah. but I, I believe it's roughly 20 years. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're starting at such a deficit on this machine. Sure. sure. Right. At what point does that machine become net positive? Yeah. yeah. You know, what year in its life did it actually turn back over and start producing enough electricity that it is made up for everything that was spent on it from, from what day one? It, from what I've read, it depends on locationally, like where you put it and what they had to do to the site prep. Like if you're having to cut off the top of a mountain to stick it on some Fair. mountain, then and like, and you know, it's really out there. Or and like floating remote. in the ocean. Yeah. Right. It's like there's a lot that goes into that versus if you can just like, turn off the highway and it's a field and you just sit it down that factors in right I let's mean, take that, then. that so we'll take the easiest route right like right. effectively you'd say like okay in oklahoma out near you know western oklahoma where we've got some big wind farms texas panhandle um i i just don't like looking at them that's my whole deal and i'm an outdoorsman so yeah you know if i'm looking through binos and staring at a mule deer i don't want to see like 300 wind turbines behind him right i just want to see the mule deer and some natural beauty yeah, right? yeah, yeah hoping something else is there but i've looked at that before actually the texas painted where i'm yeah. just staring at a mule deer through binos and behind him is 200 wind turbines right, and i'm like right. that's ugly yeah, you know yeah. luckily there's a deer here you know at least i got a little natural something out of it but i started with that sort of mentality of just let's just bring everybody in. Let's, let's talk about things. We should be open about things. Just, I, I don't, I'm an open book pretty much, you know, yeah, I mean, most right. everyone who knows me, I'm outside of that, you know, I'll tell you pretty much everything's going on. So, so it's like the advocacy thing though. Like you think your focus is like, it's prime. So it's maybe learning, maybe connecting, but it, you liked, you seem to be focused in on advocacy around oil and gas and just what we do and feeling like, cause I, and I trust me, like, I feel it. Like I feel the attack in terms of like, being somebody in the space and having that like narrative that's being pushed, there's a part of me that like, I have to rein it in sometimes because I feel sure. like I'll go hard and be sure. like, ah, but like I try to be more nuanced, but that's a main motivation for you is that those types of, like, I like the having, advocacy piece because I, I believe that the story's not told. And I, and, and again, I think ignorance is bliss. I think people live in this world of sort of, I don't really care. Yeah. I'm going to plug something in and I don't really care where it comes from. I really want them to get the right story effectively. And not saying every, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm lopsided. I, I work in the only gas business, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, I'm an outdoorsman and I, and I love all those yeah. things. And so all the same things the environmentalists are screaming right. about. Right. 
I'm a big part of those things. You know, I'm not this individual who lives in a city, drills wells, does this, does that, sells this, doesn't care. Here, poor, you know, I don't, I don't give a damn if you have 75 spills out there. Like that's not something I'm about, obviously. So I love the advocacy piece. I love the networking piece. I think that's huge. Yeah. We are social beings, right? You know, honestly, you and I sitting here feels so much better to me than you and I being on a call. You know, if we do another one of these and I'm at my office, I'm happy to jump on something or whatever and do it. Um, But you and I being together, having a beer, you know, chatting about this stuff, that's connection. Right. You know, luckily we're able to connect through the web now. Yeah. You know, I mean, think about the web thing. I think you were talking about it earlier on another one of your, on another one of your pods that was, you know, how many years, you know, when did you have your first computer? Mine was, um, seventh grade, I think, which would have been, I'm a little older than you. So six years before you, I was probably 30, you're 30, you're 34, I'm 42. Yeah. So eight year difference. Right. So, um, we had our first, like, it was a gateway. I remember that was a big brand back then. The first one that was like a modern one that was when I was, they had internet connection. I remember I was about third or fourth grade. And then, but the, we had, but we had one before that that was like DOS and like, you know, the big box. I had an Apple IIe. Yeah. Right. And we yeah. played Oregon Trail. Oh yeah. Dude, and you dysentery. died of dysentery. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or fording the river. Or right. Like a snake yeah. bite. You're always like, oh, I'm just going to, I'll just accelerate 30 days and everyone's <laughs> dead. And you're yeah, like, I should have not done that. Yeah, exactly. But it's funny about that because you, um, you know, whatever your early experience was on the computer side, you know, mine was luckily my mom, she was a school teacher. Yeah. Um, was very big on the computer side. My, my stepdad was a huge computer guy. He was an attorney. I mean, I had an old, I can't remember what it was, but it was orange screen, DOS yeah, based right, orange right. screen in my room, in my room when I was in sixth grade. Okay. I had a Mac. You remember the old box Macs? I yeah. don't even know if you remember that. Those had yeah. three and a half floppies. So at least it was past the 2E that had a five and a half inch. Yeah. You had a little three and a half inch. And I had a pen pal on AOL from, give me a second, Jasper, Mississippi. Yeah. And her name was Tracy Hanley. Holy hell, I just remembered that. Wow. So, um, so, you know, chat rooms back then, you know, all that. Right. Kind of, like AOL, like AOL, I remember dial up. AIM, dude. man. So back when we used to have dial up, we, uh, I remember it was like, we couldn't, I could, we only had one phone line. So mm-hmm. I lived in Bixby, Oklahoma is where I grew up. And, uh, we, my parents, I know somebody were, from Bixby. my parents were like, don't get on the internet. Cause you know, we might. And so I have to wait till like later in the evening when they weren't expecting a, we're not going to get a call, you know, it's later in the, yeah. it's seven or eight o'clock or whatever. And then, uh, so you get on and we'd be, I'd be chatting on instant messenger. And I remember back then. Were you chatting like, with hot babes online all day? <laughs> yeah, I guess like my friends, like and, Kip? my friends and hot, babes. it was like, uh, <laughs> it was like my middle school. I remember AOL was big for me, like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth yeah. grade. So I me, it would have like, been fourth. Yeah. Like, it yeah. A little earlier than that, but yeah. Yeah. And like, basically, uh, back then I couldn't even type. Cause I remember I was like, yep. I was chicken pecking. Cause I hadn't even taken you yeah, know, typing. Yeah, typing yet. So kids in these days, I mean, like, I don't know how young kids, it's actually kind of, it's weird to think about. I mean, we're going on tangents. That's what podcasts no, that's are for. But I mean, like, if you had a keyboard as like a kid, you think they're going to even, they're going to be more of the thumb typers with the with the cell phone. I wonder if they're going to actually have to take a class to get on a keyboard. I'm sure they will have to take it. I had typing. to take a class, typing, yeah. I took typing on a typewriter. Yeah, there you we go. We didn't even have computers on that one. So it actually was a word processor. Right. Yeah. So there's that tiny little screen like in front of you that you could see and you're sitting yeah. there, you know, typing a piece of paper over your hand. But it was a typing class. Yeah. Yeah. I had a guy that sat next to me that ended up going to prison for killing someone. Oh. I was in high school. It was weird. I remember he just wasn't there one day and the teacher walked over. She's like, yeah, he was arrested for murder. Wow. Like, Where did you grow oh, up? That's crazy. Um, H-Town, South Side. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did grow up in Houston. Yeah. Uh, but uh, down near Clear Lake, uh, Friendswood area. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was, um, um, did I just move that in the wrong place? No, you don't, you don't like yeah, that, yeah, do you? Yeah, yeah. I care, like you do whatever you want. want. No, I was just watching. I was, I was like, you're doing something. That <laughs> like, what are you doing? What are no, you doing? Like, you got it figured out. I always out. tuck like, him like over I'm this like, one I little do that? thing, like I don't know. just so I it's out of the way. But you're a gear guy. I'm weird. I know but, uh, you're a gear guy because you're talking about all these computers. You remember all the different stuff. So but. nutty. But it's, um, but you know, um, so me, for me, back to the question for me, it's yeah, the advocacy side. I want, I want people to get the right story. I want people to, or at least get both sides of a story, make their own opinion. And I think that's the key, you know, yeah. use your brain, use your logic you were given and actually 
come and form an opinion about something. Right. Instead of just following. And right. I think that's the disruption that needs to take place where you disrupt the thought process of humans overall because we've been so programmed, I feel like, over the years of staring at TVs, staring at computers, at least in our era. You know, I mean, we, we weren't part of the group that didn't have TVs or whatever else. But in our, you know, growing up, like we were, you were always forced advertising. You were always for, I, I think you're JP, you know, y'all's, y'all's podcast earlier on the marketing side and everything else. It was, you know, you're, you're forced all this stuff as a child, you're watching Saturday morning cartoons, right. you know, and they're right. shoving transformers yeah. in your face right. or whatever right. is the current deal. My day age, it was He-Man or yeah. whatever, you they know, got a new G.I. Joe. On, they got a new He-Man on Netflix. That's you real? see that? No. Yeah, there's a brand new 2021. They just released a new Masters of the Universe. What? They revamped it. And I was like, is I it had the he- same? It's pretty much. They okay. just, yeah, it's like, it's it doesn't look as crappy though. No, it looks a little better, yeah. but I, uh, I had He-Man toys too. I would have been, I was born in 87, January of 87, but, uh, I had a bunch of He-Man toys back then, and I, they saw this new Masters of the Universe. I watched the first episode. I was like, okay. I like that. My favorite, my favorite <laughs> was the, I had the He-Man. My favorite was the one that, like, you punched his chest and it, like, cratered. Yeah. Remember those? I had that one. Did it, I had the ones, I had a bunch of different ones. I had, like, the He-Man uh, station, and you'd put it together, and it was, like, the ship, and I don't know, anyways, I had a bunch of He-Man toys. Of stuff. But yeah. um, I've always wanted to get, you know what I've always wanted to do is I've always wanted to stop by the... Um, uh, action figure museum down on 35 that I've passed like the sign of forever. I've seen that. Yeah. I've never gone. I've never gone to that either. And I kind of want to go. I was like, yeah. yeah, I'd like to see what they have in there, you know, yeah. but, um, but again, circling back, um, this, you know, this to me is, is at least enlightening. Yeah. I hope. Right. Right. Like right. someone to at least take something from it and say, hadn't thought about it that way right. or whatever that may be. Like you've done, you've covered Bitcoin you've covered all these things yeah. going on and, and bringing Bitcoin and natural gas together. What a deal, you know, for that to take place. Like the guy, I love in- that topic because I'm always fascinated about, I spent my whole career trying to sell natural gas for a higher price. And then someone told me you can sell it for 20 something dollars. I was like, I'm gonna learn this. Per M? Yeah. Per yeah. M. Done. I was like, I'm gonna learn this. A hundred percent. And I was like, I'm gonna figure this out. And then, uh, you know, the guy's doing it in Tulsa, right? Yeah. Uh, is it Spears? I know Charlie Spears. He's a good guy. Maurice uh, Storm and, uh, Chris Bird. Uh, uh exponent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exponent. Yeah. They're yeah, doing those the Wampa guys. mining stuff. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're doing that deal. And I mean, I, I've, you know, I started on, have you heard of the, uh, pie currency? Have you seen any of that? Uh-uh. Currently yeah. these guys out of Stanford that started this deal is all through phones though. It's kind of interesting. So each phone can only earn. So you, you can't build, basically you cannot build a Bitcoin mining solution, you know, out on a, on a deal because it's all done by phone. Like you can only earn so much based on your circle, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. We can talk about it later, but those kind of things are fascinating to me. I like the way things are moving forward. I really do. I mean, overall, I, I you know, I've got bitches and complaints about a world of, you know, policy and everything else right. and the broad brush, brush piece that just drives me up the wall. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's mostly, you know, the advocacy piece. I'm very proud of what I do. I'm very proud of our industry. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't, I, I refuse to. Be apologetic. I, I'm, I do not apologize for what we do. What we create for people on a on a daily basis. And what I look at where EnergyNet's concerned, we're not a producer, right? Yeah. We're a transaction advisor. But that right. transaction advisor is taking an asset that Chevron, for example, or whomever else, is looking at as non-core no longer valuable to them, does not move the needle, yet right. we sell it down the market to someone else who's going to operate that deal for the next 40 years. And they may sell that down to someone else who's going to market, who's going to operate that for the next 40 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That sustainability. Right. Right? Those barrels still count. Those 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 MCF still count. Right. You know, every right. every bit of product that comes out of the ground on that level always counts. If you can continue those fields, if you can continue that development at a lower cost, and that's the key, right? So if it's a Devon that says, man, you know, we just can't afford to operate this anymore. Right, right. Someone else can operate it far cheaper. Right. And they'll keep that and going. They focus on it. It's like and they baby. need to be, those barrels need to be in the market. Right. And, and that gas needs to be in the market. Yeah. And that's not a small thing. No, that's what I liked about the Bitcoin stuff is that we've looked at like some, uh, legacy assets that probably have no value selling the gas and you look at it like can i convert it into a digital store of value and then it's like i'm taking that energy i'm trapping it in a digital form and then it has uh 
the shelf life is in, you can store it for however long you want. You take it, convert it to value, store it digitally, and then it, you can trans, you can move it across space and time. And like in some future, you can send it at the speed of light to you at the press of a button. It's like, I can take the energy, convert it into value, send it to you across the world at the speed of light. You can sit on it and then in five years, spend it. And it's like, that's just crazy to me. That's it's crazy. Like, it's a way to like take energy, harness the value of it, and uh, it's a whole, I, I've done lots of podcasts on it. I'm going to continue to do it. Yeah. It's fascinating to me because I just, I, anything that like, and it's a pro energy demand, natural gas demand. Um, the cool thing about Bitcoin is that it's like a, it's like a, uh, it's an energy backed currency. Yeah. Because the way that it's formed is through, cons it's a consuming a huge en consumption, energy, energy, right? And so people don't understand that consumption. I don't think. No, they don't. Well, and the thing about it is, and I, again, it's, I feel like this always turns into a Bitcoin thing, but like the, uh, like it's <laughs> only cause you, it's only cause you cause brought, you had a couple of podcasts to go. Yeah. And, like, and I, and I, and I think about it a lot, but like the, the proof of work mechanism, which is this consuming energy, that's what allows it to be decentralized because it's basically like all Bitcoin mining is, is a, uh, it's like a bank you're processing transactions yep. and you process those transactions and you get rewarded with Bitcoin. And so, but the way you process those is with consuming energy. Yep. And so it's like, kind of like the gold standard was backed on gold. Like the Bitcoin is backed on energy. So yep. it's like underpinned by energy. And so the whole thing has just been like, when I first learned about it, and I've said this before on the pod is like, I was like pacing around at night. I was like listening to podcasts about it and like learning about it. And first it was like the 20 something bucks in M and I was just like, whoa, 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 whoa wait, hey wait, wait, wait. I was like, I got to get that. I was like, I got to learn this. <laughs> and then it was just understanding the implications of it. And I remember the first night that it kind of clicked for me. I was like pacing around my house, like one in the morning, like thinking about it. And I was like, holy crap. I was like, this is crazy. I was like, you can get more value. And I was like, you can be, I don't know. It's just a whole topic that I think it's positive for energy. I think it's positive for what we do. You can get more value for energy. You can take stranded energy or energy that people don't think has value. Like think of a PDP package that's some dry gas and you look at it and you're like, eh, we're selling this. Like now gas is four bucks or whatever, but gas is two bucks or some low amount. You got this plugging liability. You got these costs. Most people view that and they're like, this is just a crappy Ow. asset, right? But if I can take it, I can convert that asset to a digital form of value, store that, I can pay my LOE. I can uh, pay the plug-in liabilities Easily. in the future, right? And then now I have this thing that, and not only that, there's like a social element to it because Mark will be like, and other people, Mark, he's coming around to Bitcoin. I've convinced <laughs> him to it. But other people will be like, well, what's the value to society? It gets back to this thing around uh, people that are burning wood or dung or something in these other countries. It's like, well, if you could bring them natural gas or oil, that would be a positive for them. Well, with Bitcoin, it's like there's four and a half billion people that don't even have a checking account. They have no access to banking right? right and so and if you're in guatemala or these so there's a lot of countries where it's very difficult like i'll pick on guatemala because i heard this on a podcast the other day like you can't just go withdraw a couple thousand dollars from the bank you have to fill out forms and apply to the government to get your money out because the money is so regulated if you just had your money on your cell phone and you could send it me and you back and forth no fees you can have your own checking account you control it and i'm like there's actually a good to society there sure. you have to think about it a little sure. bit you can't be like this uh so to me it's like it can be a good for society it can give people a form of money that they can use and it's good for energy it's a store of energy it's almost like a battery kind of that's it's right like you convert it to you convert the energy to value and you store it and I'm like, that is fascinating. Still has value. It's fascinating to me. It still has value and it stays there. And it doesn't it's have not a heating value, but it's a, you know, yeah, you've just shifted it. You know? Right. Well, and think about it too. If you think about the grid, that's why I like the off-grid mining for Bitcoin. Because yeah. if you get if you're on the grid, like just to go through the grid, you gotta send it through a big pipeline system, process it, and then get it onto the grid, turn it into power. You lose a lot of energy across the grid. Then they got to, then they mine for Bitcoin. But if you just take it to the wellhead and mine for Bitcoin, you cut out all that waste yep. and you convert that energy into value and then you can store it. And there's no shelf life. Like think of that when oil went negative, if you could have just stored your energy from that oil On for the Bitcoin six side. months, yeah. or, I mean, even if it wasn't or Bitcoin, whatever, just like whatever, like if you produced oil and you didn't have to sell it at negative 30 bucks, right. you could have just been like, no, nah, I'm going to hold it. Well, nobody, people were like calling me about like, hey, how can I get storage? How can I get you tanks? See, yeah, like people I, were like, same. where can I get yeah. tanks? Where can I store this oil? And I'm like, it's gonna be tough, man. How many people outside of the industry called you on that level? So when many, they heard about it, so like it was people. nutty. Like you heard from all your friends that you never call you. People wanted to put oil in swimming pools and Literally. store it. Yeah, yeah it's negative. Like, can, can I, I can I can I like get the barrels and you know you know just keep it on my place? Yeah. And I was like, but eh. think if you could convert like energy <laughs> into a value and then it just there's no shelf life. It just stays there. 
You yeah. walk in the value and it just sits there. So for me, it's fascinating from a number of different angles. It, it, a lot of people, like they look at Bitcoin or these other cryptos and they think of it from an investment thing. I'm not even thinking of an investment thing. I'm like, this is energy. Like sure. It affects the energy business. So that's, that's why right. I've gravitated towards it. It's, it's, uh, and, and good for, I mean, you know, look what's taken place in such a short amount of time right. for that to take place. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's so short. And so, you know, for us to, you, I, I, I just, I feel like that, you know, moving ahead, I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think we're going right. to see more and more of that, you know, level of, you know, shifting of, you know, converting it's a conversion deal, right? Like, can we convert this to that and make it useful? Sure. Let's do it. It's the future. We talk about computers. We talk about the th way things are evolving. And uh, it's just something that I see that's interesting. I think it's going to affect the deal space. I mean, think if you're, I think if you're selling an asset and someone's now putting a Bitcoin value on it. Oh. Okay, it's like, oh, here's the PV10 or PV15. Here is the PV10 if you put one miner out there. And like, so, yeah, you can look at an asset that is... Uh, Stranded, the, yeah, stranded, crummy, crummy, the worst thing you've ever seen, right? And then you're like, but Texas if I just panhandle, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. But you're like, but if I spent, uh, you know, 10 million bucks on miners, not even that much, think about a million bucks, I could turn that into a 10 million dollar a year cash flow stream. It just changes the paradigm. Oil and gas, I think, is going to be gradually, then suddenly, it's gonna, it's gonna go great because like oil and gas is like, there's this weird thing with oil and gas where it's like. There's a lot of people stuck in their ways. And mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily an all age. It, that's it. it's, it's not an age thing either. It's just a, I mean, some of it's an some age thing. Some of it's an age thing. You got to realize, like, I'm the, Chris and I, so like when we came in, Bill, uh, who started EnergyNet, you know, he's, you know, call it, you know, 30 years my senior, right? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a gap in our industry, and I'm I'm the end of that gap, effectively. So from Bill to me, you know, no one really got into our industry because of where it was at the right. time, back in the 80s and right. everything else. Right. Like, no, it was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. You look at all the colleges and, and all the other places that shut down geology programs and engineering right. programs. It's happening that now. Were, yeah. And so for that, you know, we, you know, you, you're a little younger than me, but, but the gap is, is, you know, there's a 30 year gap there that no right. one existed effectively because right. nobody right. wanted to be into it because there wasn't any money to be made. Right. If we can diversify all those things moving forward, we then just gained a world of people and talented yeah. people and smart right. people right. that you can bring into it on different levels. It doesn't have yeah. to be the standard I'm an engineer or I'm a geologist right. or I'm a BD or I'm a sales right. guy or I'm a this, right. it's a, you know, you've literally, you know, shifted to where you can actually drag other people into this industry that never thought they would be in it. Well, these Bitcoiners is funny because I talk to these guys and I know a lot of guys that are in the space now because I've made it a point to make those connections. And that was part of it too. It wasn't just the, uh, the value or the change. It was like, wait, you're telling me that like, computer programmers and like these Silicon Valley types and Bitcoin's not necessarily Silicon Valley. It's all types of, it's all types of tech, but it's that world is like somehow merging with our world. I was like, this is like exciting. I was like, this is weird. But there why are we not powering that on the only, okay. So question to you yeah, yeah. then <clears throat> from that, I don't mean to stop you, but no, that, that point specifically in so, for example, the Bitcoin side, right? So you're just now taking actual raw gas, effectively, yeah. and converting it into Bitcoin, right? Yeah, right? So that's one set of it when, you know, you're taking, like, you're doing the carbon credit side, right? Yeah. So, like, Musk, you know, buys X number of carbon credits up in Alaska, you know, right. for some timbered area that, that will never be touched and right, everything else. Right. You know, the land mitigation stuff that's going on right now yeah, and everything yeah, yeah. else and selling those out. Instead of that route, if you were just connecting literally to the off-grid version of us, right. why could we not power all of Silicon Valley? Because yeah. all they're doing is trading credits at this right. point. It's like, right. well, you've used X. They use so much energy. Yeah, yeah. No one understands that. Like right. the, the amount of energy used on the computing side of everything, the Huge. storage side, Huge. the cloud side of everything. Right. It's immense. It's immense. I've loved that topic. So we looked at like, uh, someone told me the other day, or I've read the other day that like consumer electronics is like 13%. Maybe I'm getting this wrong again. Someone correct me, but I think it's like 13% consumer electronics. And that's like for funsy stuff, like mm -hmm. computers, you know. Drones. Uh, drones, lights, lights, all these things. Mics, bullshit. And uh, yeah, exactly. Our stuff toys. That, stuff that's like not like heating or cooling your home or things There's a new survive. laser game program you can bring to home, by the way. Right. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, so that kind of stuff. And then you look at, uh, 
then Bitcoin and it uses like point zero is point like it's a tenth of one percent of the world's industry energy. Yeah. But like people are like, oh, it uses so much energy, it's so blah blah blah. And I'm like, that's a weird negative thing. Those guys are. It's funny because those guys are being attacked for their energy usage. And I'm like, welcome to the club. Yeah. I'm like, welcome to being attacked by a. Uh, this is there's this weird like bond. Your own peeps. I was like, yeah, there's this weird bond <laughs> that I'm having with the Bitcoin people where they're like, we're getting attacked by environmentalists and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to the club. Yeah. I'm like every <laughs> day. Yeah, we've been getting this for a while. And then uh, the other, I had a guest on uh, last night or two nights ago, and he's a buddy of mine. He's got just recently gotten a solar. And we talked about solar for a long time, and he was saying that in Oklahoma, or not not in Oklahoma, but nationwide, I don't know if this is true again, but this is okay. what he told me. He said nationwide, 1% of our energy is used on grow houses for marijuana, Weed. medical marijuana. Okay. Yeah. And he was like, 1%. He said, in Oklahoma, I said, what are you chasing in Oklahoma with solar? And he goes, grow houses. He goes, okay. there's so much energy. And I'm like, I hadn't seen a lot about those people getting attacked for that. Have you no. seen a lot about them getting attacked not, for their not, energy? I mean, a little a- bit. Maybe I've read something about- I have the- a buddy who has a sizable one. Yeah, uh, here in Oklahoma City, right. um, and they uh, the way they 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 built it out, it actually worked out really well. But it was um, they've got about eighty thousand square feet indoor. Yeah, grow. That's a lot. It's a lot, and yeah. it's and it's and it takes you know obviously consumption. I mean, you're looking at lighting and cooling and yeah. heating and whatever else. Right. And so, um, <clears throat> and that's a sizable grow, and it, it's um, you know with that you know whatever his usage is, but. You don't, again, you're back to you're not seeing anybody attacking them. I haven't seen a lot of it. Well, why would you? I mean, I don't know. I mean, because you're sort of on that level. It's like, well, but you got back to our level of, you know, we're okay with that. Right. That's a different thing. Like, you're, it's weird. And it's like the, it's the moralization of energy. I like that. And that gets back to like all these things we're talking about. And it flows through to Bitcoin, it flows through to the, uh, the medical marijuana, it flows through to all these other things. But it's like, who decides? There was a big thing this week where uh, California, C, uh, Washington, Oregon, I can't remember, there's two other states, there's five states total, and they made it illegal, or not illegal, I think it's, like, they made they passed a law where basically certain gaming computers okay. that used a certain amount of energy, that you can't buy them anymore. So like Alienware, which was like Dell, yep. they have a computer, their top gaming computer, can't buy it in California anymore. There's a, there's a disclaimer on their website that says, we do not ship this to California, Washington, Oregon, and two other states. I can't remember. Because of usage. Because of power usage. They, they, they've passed a law. It was effective July 1, where we can no longer sell these gaming computers. And I'm like, that's moralization of energy. So they're gonna out, are they going to outlaw hot tubs? Yeah, literally. Rich guys that fly in private jets. It's like in your, in the EU, they're talking about a tax on, a, on a jet fuel but they're excluding private jets. Oh, that's different. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like Leonardo DiCaprio. You go on his uh, Twitter, and he's like got a picture of him in like a tuxedo at like an environmental conference, and he's like speaking on something. And on his bio, it says environmentalist, activist, blah, 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 blah. And at the very yeah. end, it's like actor. I'm like, no. I'm like, you're not, an, I'm like, you're not an environmentalist. You're an I was actor. Like, yeah, you're an first actor. First and foremost. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I'm a business development guy, first and foremost. Yeah, right. And then right. outside of that, you know, we can go into... <laughs> activist and whatever right, i'm an right. activist for the oil and gas industry right i'm a, I'm a this some of that i mean you're not a, you're not an environmentalist if you have a yacht and you fly around on private jets i'm like if you really want to make it to difference, the conference yeah right that you're headed to it's like uh uh john Kerry. he was like uh flew to some thing to accept some award for being an environmentalist he took a private jet yeah. and he was like well you know that's the only way i can get there i'm like no it's no not. it's not it's not actually the only way you can get not there. only i mean you want to take a, you could take a boat that like kid proved it from uh, Netherlands or whatever, wherever she's from. I mean, uh, you know, she took a boat for a long way, you yeah. know, to get there. Right. Um, what's her name? Uh, Greta. Greta. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and she's, so she's proven you don't have to take a jet. To, but this to is get the there. moralization of energy consumption and production, and it gets back to like who decides? Who decides that a gaming computer is bad, but that a private jet that Elizabeth Warren takes to a rally is good? Who Government. decides? Yeah, or it's the narrative. It's media and narrative. Actually, I think it's more media, I think, more than anything. But that's, you know, I, you know, I, again, here's the thing. Like, get back to Bezos, right? Like, let's let's talk about his, you know, 15-minute trip to the space right, or whatever right. else. I saw a really good one where they said, you know, hey, you know, good for him. He did the same thing, like a animal that can, you know, like lick his own butt, you know, uh, in 1961, <laughs> took a far longer trip around the globe actually orbited, you know, for a period of time, you know, versus what just took place. Great for private, private space flight. Yeah. Awesome. Good for you. I don't care how he spends it. I, you know, that was the whole thing. Like everyone was like, Oh my God, he spent all this money. I was like, 
I don't give a damn what he spent his money on. I don't I don't care what he spent his money on. I'm just saying like this thing that took place for private space flight, great. For what took place, eh, like we've done far bigger things right. other than this. Right. Like zooming up for a little bit and then coming back down, like good for you. But outside of that, I you know, I don't care what he spent his money on. I don't, you know, give a damn what it cost. I don't whatever the energy cost was, no one's gonna blambast him for it because he roamed up to it's space his money. and a yeah, it's I mean, like, funny. There was like this meme I saw. I love memes, by the way. And it was like this meme I saw that it showed a picture of a crying person, like crying face. And it, it was like an illustration of a face that was crying. And it was like a billionaire spending $5 billion of his own money to go to space. And then it was like a smiling face. And it was like NASA spending $200 billion of your money to go to space. And the person was smiling. Yeah. And it was like, okay. There like, you go. Like, that's it. <laughs> like, you know. like memes like this. Speak, uh, yeah. speak to me. I'm like, yeah, there you go. So this guy, you're going to demonize this guy for spending $5 billion of his own money. This is dollars. That he made. He made it. But you're going to get praise NASA for spending $200 billion of our money. Yeah. It's the American dream that you can't have because yeah. you're not that. Yeah. Like effectively, like it's right. like, well, we want you to come here. Like that's always been it, you know, entrepreneurship and growing and learning and everything else. And then, but if you go do it and spend a whole lot of money doing so, you're kind of an asshole. Yeah. Right. And that's, they that's, wanna, that bugs they me. Wanna, yeah. I mean, you know, keep it, you know, let it, let him do what he wants to do. Um, but yeah, I, you know, like you said, advocacy is my deal. Uh, networking is huge. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. people need to be involved. People it's, need to be involved with all levels of it. If you're in our industry, I think you need to be involved. I, shameless plug for the Petroleum Alliance. I, I'm a, on the board of that. Um, and, you know, what a great group, what we put together, what we've done, you know, yeah. what we've done with, yeah. uh, Oakland, with OIPA, with Oklahoma Oil and Gas Association, bringing those together. Right. That was a huge feat. Um, it was good to see it needed to happen, you know, in the state. Um, we need that advocacy. We need people working for us on the, the political level. If you understand the political machine, if you don't understand the political machine, get knowledgeable, right. honestly, because right. you don't understand where your dollars are going. Right. And you don't understand what these people are actually fighting for. If you're not actually involved in those organizations locally and or statewide and or nationwide, you need to be involved in those things right. because you need right. a voice and you need to have knowledge of what's taking place. And if you're not on the forefront of that stuff, you're going to look up one day and go, why did all this take place? Well, you weren't there. Yeah. You know, you didn't yeah. see how right. all this came to fruition. You right. know, you didn't see the battles that took place on the, on the political level to make it happen. And you have to have it. You have to have those advocates that are out there working for you on an everyday basis because guess what? There's a lobbyist in there from everyone else. Right. Every minute of the day, yeah. constantly. 100%. So you got to make it happen. Um, but it's also, it's fun though, right? The content stuff. Oh, it's shit, like, dude. Yeah, I love it, dude. I, I, you know, I, um, I, you know, I've always, I've always liked this side of it. I like the, the, I just always wanted to keep it level. Yeah. And I don't like watching the, like you said, the pundit side, the news side that, you know, I take so much from every, I watch all of them. I mean, right. I'll literally tune into just about every one of them. I'll listen to <clears throat> off, you know, off business, you know, or off industry podcast or whatever else, just to kind of hear what they're saying. Like what's, what's the narrative on their right. side and why, you know, where, where are they coming up with this? And you almost want to educate them. You try to, I had a buddy right. of mine that lived in Colorado for a long time, Denver, um, that joined Greenpeace and he was a engineer, oil and gas. Yeah. He was a petroleum engineer. Right. And joined Greenpeace in Colorado just to right their wrongs, literally joined it. And then when he first kind of filled him in on what he did, they were like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, you can't be here. He was yeah. like, I need to be here. And he's like, here's why. Right. What you're putting out is so the, the fallacies that you're producing. Right. Are so egregious no one believes them. Yeah. This is yeah. ridiculous right. to a point. So let me correct you in a lot of things. Like, cause he, he, he was a big, um, um, what was the triathlete? So, you know, where they do the shooting and the skiing and everything else, you know, the, the decathlon, de, de, is it decathlon? Something. Know, is something. decathlon or whatever, but they, um, he, he's going to kill me if he sees this. He's going to be like, it's something, the ones where they do a lot they of ski and they shoot and they, you know, it's cross country and they do all the stuff. Like no there's a whole idea. level of, you know, yeah, something like that. stuff. I, I remember there was like a Nintendo game, uh, long ago that like sort yeah, of mimic this, but, that. um, but, um, but you know, he joined, he literally joined for the fact that he said, you guys are producing so much stuff that is so off base. Like it, it's so outlandish. Like you've got to drag this back in. He's right. like, you're not telling the right story and helped him. Yeah. And that's great. Like that's openness. And if, and if we can't all be a part of that, and if no one else is willing on any other side to do so, 
we've got a problem. Yeah. I mean, if you and I are willing to talk about it and sit here and talk about it and be open to talking about it to anyone under the sun, I'm, I'm happy to listen. Right. You know, give me your, give me your thoughts. Give me your reason. Yeah. Open dialogue, uh, nuanced Make- conversations. That's what the pods are about. And I think it's the humanization of what we do, humanization of people in our industry, the open dialogue, the nuanced topics. And I think that you should do more of it. You seem to be, you enjoy it. You seem to like this is a natural thing for you to do. And uh, we're hitting like two hours here uh, ish. So I think we're just over. Yeah. So no, we, we had a good chat, man. I had yeah, a, we did. Got a beer. It's Friday afternoon yeah. in Oklahoma. It's, yeah. a, it's a good time. I'll say um, one uh, on the closing side. We're we're about done. But um, on, first and foremost, thank you. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed it, and I think we need. To, I want to do more of this. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and looking forward to it. Um, energy environment side, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, this has kind of, um, uh, motivated me to, you know, move that a little forward and I've got right. some ideas on that thing, but, um, the people in our industry, you know, and I think you, you see this as well are amazing people. Right. And, and, you know, when, you, and that's the thing is you've got to get down to the people side of it, because if you don't, then you just sort of, you, you have this beast you're attacking and you don't know who's there. And it's the same as me attacking, you know, anyone on the, on the environmental side from, you know, close to home podcast or all or no place like home podcast right. or any of those, like I'm not attacking those people. I, I appreciate what they're feeling, what they're going through. They're coming at it from a place of they want to do good. That's it. Like and so, it. and then all of us do, I feel like most, yeah, most people want to want, you know, to do good. So if we can open it up a little more right. better, if we can yeah. drag other people in, yeah. better. If we can bring this conversation together, better. Right. And and let's make it happen on a consistent basis, not on this one off basis. I mean, shit, you and I have been trying to get together for I don't know, it's weeks, hard. months, yeah. whatever. But I mean, the the more often we can have these conversations and these topics and everything else, I think the better everyone else is gonna be and and drag other people into it. I think you were talking earlier on your live deals like you know, can we bring in questions on like Twitter yeah. or whatever else right, and right. You know, make that happen? I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Like do so, you know, yeah. like let's answer some real questions from people and, and at least our opinions, right. They don't have to agree with them, but you know, what are your thoughts? And, yeah. and at least, you know, allow people to open their minds just a bit. Sure. And I think if you open it just a bit, you'll see that, you know, you drag it out a little further. Absolutely. Yeah. Ethan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for Uh, having me. I appreciate you coming and doing it. We'll do it again. We'll do something else. We're going to collaborate. Hell yeah, man. I like it. No, it's good. Take care.